yes, I think we have a, a group from Stanford Groundwater Architecture Project. Um, uh, we'll turn the time over to them. I think they have a, I think they have some uh, video that we're going to pull up as well for you. Okay, go ahead. The presentation could be best served if you were speaking at the microphone. We'll record it. Okay. Well, I can see the video is on, so let's do the video, and I can do a short presentation afterwards. Or you can okay. sit right there. That one works. Oh, you can, when you make your presentation, you can use that microphone there okay. if, you, if you prefer. Yeah. Does it have sound? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The district currently is 100% dependent on groundwater today, and we project even in the future groundwater is going to play a critical role in serving our customers. So we are very interested in ensuring that that water is sustainable today and in the future. And so that requires we get as much information as we can. So in their attempts to build these models, they have very limited data. They have well data, but well data only samples directly beneath where that well is located. And many of the wells in that area don't go very deep. So the objective of the Skytrain survey is to acquire geophysical data that allows them to image over a large area to a depth of about a thousand feet below the ground surface, mapping out how sediment type is there, or clay are much more likely to be conducted. And, and so if we see a much compacted unit, we would interpret it as the presence of more clay in that area. They're also interested in mapping out the distribution of salt water and fresh water. Salt water is much more likely to be conducted than fresh water. And so if we see a conducted signature in an area, we could attribute that to salt water. And this is basic information that they need to build models to help them better understand how to effectively manage their groundwater resources, but they also have a particular interest at this moment in time in understanding the potential impact of the proposed desalination operation on their groundwater resources. Partnering with us in this study is Aquagia Framework. They've been acquiring sky data in other states for the past few years. I have been partners on this. It's a really important part of ensuring our success. The starting point when we talk about the sky system is a large transmitter loop that hangs beneath the helicopter. And through that loop, current is sent. By sending current through that loop, you can generate a magnetic field. That when it gets over the ground, it gets converted to current, the current flows through the ground, and you measure where the current goes. Those currents are really like sampling the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. And those currents then generate secondary magnetic fields that is recorded by an instrument also carried through the helicopter. This is going to provide us with information, especially since we're able to take what is provided here and ground truth it with other information. <coughs> what we've been working on over the last few years is to use a different physical method, where instead of using a magnetic field to induce current flow, you actually inject current into the subsurface. And the method we used was called electrical resistivity tomography. So in that study, we moved along the moderate beach with electrodes and 22 and a half meters and getting current into the subsurface and mapping out the change in the electric properties of the subsurface down to a depth of about a feet. So that gave us a slice just right below your feet as you walk along the beach. You can see the depth of a thousand feet. It was one 25 mile long slice. Well, now what we want to do is to be able to move farther inland. We found out that we didn't have to just put isolated points to get the ERT, that we could put instrumentation on a helicopter and fly an area that really got a 3D image. That was really attractive to the district and the that was available. Your ERT survey will serve as an amazing check, uh, first of all, to see whether our values are lining up with what we were collected with the ERT. System is working, we can see what the difference is. How the system has changed from 2014 to 2017. Uh, how much salt water has come in or moved out of the system based on different pumping and based on uh, how much uh, groundwater management and greenhouse is coming in the area. When we acquired the data along the coastline, it took us about a week and a half to 
are 25 miles from the area. And the Skyhunt survey was only collecting 375 miles of data in a few days. So this is just an incredible opportunity that comes in this data set. What we're moving toward is trying to play a zero sum game where uh, the water in equals the water out. So that we're not continually depleting our water resources. In order to do that, we need to characterize the region with high degree of certainty and stable continuity. That's what the system offers. A real enthusiasm is mine to get broader options of your system methods for groundwater management. So we are absolutely thrilled to be involved with bringing those water systems to the project. And it's very nice to think about your system methods to improve your groundwater models. Supplement this with a, with a presentation, and this presentation is part of a, a larger presentation. We're also having a discussion later. Excuse me, not too close, sorry. I would just like to show a few slides on the background of this technology and some of the developments that have been going on in Denmark, which I think are relevant for the discussion. Could you also just begin by identifying yourself? Yes, sorry. My name is uh, Jakob Vind. I'm uh, with the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so I'm basically a water diplomat. I live here in California and I run a, a number of water technology alliances. I'm just going to say two words about it so you have a better idea of uh, what we're doing here. And see if this works. So this is just going to be full gallop. I only have a few minutes, uh, and uh, just going to say two words about why I'm here. Then two words about the Danish Sigma. We had a Sigma program in Denmark for 20 years, uh, quite similar to what is going on here in California. And then a, two f a few short cases uh, of relevance to uh, to this area. Um, the Water Alliance I'm working with. We do uh, groundwater. We do water distribution and wastewater. Uh, we have what is, I think is interesting, partners that are the Danish EPA, the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, our innovation center here in California, and uh, the four largest uh, water utilities in Denmark, alongside a number of technology providers, including uh, SkyTem, uh, the helicopter system you just saw before. So you're thinking, why are we here? What are, what are a bunch of Danes doing in California? And the short answer is, Denmark wants to be known for more than the Little Mermaid in Copenhagen <laughs> and Danish pastry. And we're actually quite proud of what we're doing within water. We're a very small country and we need to go out into the world, collaborate, share knowledge, share ideas. And uh, yeah, this is a great place to, to be to do exactly that. And, and that's why we're here. So the, the country of Denmark has a vision to be a, a world leader within water technology. And we need to collaborate to achieve that. Uh, and also, you might know us for Lego. So this is a big Lego model of the Danish water system, and this is our prime minister uh, proudly taking a photo of it. I'm going to come back to the Lego shortly. Two words about Denmark, small country, roughly a tenth of the size of California, a lot of coastline, a lot of ag, two-thirds ag land. We have 5.6 million people. We produce 28 million pigs, so our pigs per person ratio is quite high. Uh, <laughs> We're 100% reliant on groundwater, which, of course, with, uh, with the ag intensity and pigs causes some issues. We have a, a prevention before a treatment policy, so we cannot treat our water. We pump it out of the ground, oxidize it, and run it through a sand filter. Uh, so naturally, we are taking great care of our resource uh, since we cannot treat it. Uh, yeah, there are a few other facts up there. I'll skip on. So, just to say, Denmark is not a fairy tale land. This is what it looked like 20, 30 years ago. We had de uh, de decreasing water tables. We had saline water intrusion from all our coastline. We had a lot of water quality issues, lack of stream flows, uh, a lot of the same issues uh, as I think you're seeing here in California. Uh, it's just a few more examples uh, nutrient pollution in the lake and lack of stream flow. So this is our Sigma. We did it from 1999 until 2015. We financed it by a, a small tax on the, on the water consumption. We don't have Proposition 218 in Denmark, so <laughs> it was a bit easier, I have to say. Uh, but what, what is interesting for this conversation is we did a detailed mapping of 40% of our land area. So even though we are a small country, that's still quite a large area. And if you look at the purple um, marks on this map, that's the... Uh, that's all the mapping, and it is mainly in the, the urban areas. The, the, the main uh, rural areas are on the west of the, the country. Um, and it costs us about $500 million. 
Uh, like here, it's a collaborative effort. EPA, municipalities, they are our GSAs. We didn't form new organizations. We handled it within the uh, existing municipalities, consultants, universities, and then the geological survey have the role of data uh, handlers out here with probably DWI. I'm going to skip this. We'll take that in the afternoon. Key learning. Uh, it's invaluable to get the right data before you start making critical, costly decisions. So this is just my own very personal. I think this is a good way of showing it in a very simple way. We probably, many of us, uh, have a similar experience like this. Uh, it's, it's quite painful. Um, so uh, a main issue in Denmark is we supplemented geology with geophysics. I'm just going to show you a very specific example. So this is a this is a groundwater model. We're looking, we're hovering above, looking into. This is one of our models, um, and you can see the darker areas are the deeper areas. So the, the purple ones would be our paleo channels. So this is a groundwater model. It's ba it's a it's an eight by eight, eight a mile area, and it's based on information from uh, over 500 wells. So we felt it was a pretty good uh, basis of assumption. Uh, the problem was we had some, some water flows we could not explain. The water was disappearing. Uh, so we, and this was only based on the well, so we supplemented this with the geophysics. This was before the helicopter. Uh, we did uh, 1,400 uh, ground-based soundings of geophysics to supplement this data. And this is what our model looked like after that data came into it. And as you can see, we discovered a paleo channel that was previously not detected uh, because of shallower wells in that area. Uh, and also we get a lot more detail in our model. So that was really a key, key experience in Denmark is to supplement these two disciplines to get a lot better understanding and get a regional understanding of the interconnectedness of, of the water system. And I'm going to skip this because Rosemary told uh, beautifully about it. There's, I'll, you'll get the slides. There's, there's another video from a Nebraska project that explains uh, the data that's coming out of it a little more. You can see the, the cross-section Rosemary showed. What you get with the helicopter is basically just a, a lot of uh, data. I'm going to skip this. I just want to do a final point on data management. Don't, you don't need to understand this. I just want to tell you that in Denmark we have had an extensive data management approach. We have uh, 100% transparent, fully open databases on all our geophysics, all our wells, including chemistry, water tables, uh, all the well description, geology. Uh, we have all reports that are done. You can go in and select an area and find all consulting reports that have been done over a large number of years, and all our models. All of that is publicly available in open databases. Uh, and then we are combining that with software. Once again, if you're interested in some of your staff, I've included all the links so you can actually access all the Danish databases online and see all our data. So here you'll see that all our wells, that's the, 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 up, the upper left picture, you'll see there's uh, quite an, uh, a lot of wells in Denmark. You can see all the data. Uh, but what is interesting here, and which is my last point, is that so that's fine, we have a very nice and uh, comprehensive national uh, data system, but how do we do it on a local level? How do we manage data, and how do we manage our data locally? Uh, and how do we adhere? Denmark is a highly regulated country, so kind of like you will have uh, responsibilities in Sigma to come up with reports and, and do monitoring and stuff like that. It's exactly the same in Denmark, so we've had an issue of how do we handle our local data and put it up uh, satis uh, satisfactorily to the, uh, to the national authorities. So this is just uh, seven key drivers for that scattered data. Um, once again, you can see it, but I think scattered data is at least something I, we had a big problem with in Denmark. I see it a lot in California as well. That's my time. Are you fine? No, keep going. Keep going. Okay, no, but uh, somebody's fine. Okay, okay. No, no worries. So this this is just to to stay in the Lego model. You don't need to look at all the specifics of this. But what we've done in Denmark on a local level is we've developed a modular off-the-shelf uh, framework for data management. And it's basically like Lego bricks. So I think not 100% but close to 100% of all our GSAs use the same system. It will not look the same because all, all districts are different, all agencies are different. Uh, so on the, on the left side you see some of the potential inputs you want to have in. It's a single brick. And depending on what you need to, uh, to achieve sustainability in your basin and handle your data, your, your, your framework will look 
different. So that's why the, the Lego model is good. And then on the output side, once again, it depends on what kind of reports you need to do, what kind of stakeholders you have in your basin. So what do you want to take out of it? So you can basically put your stuff in here, and it will, it will provide you with whatever you need in terms of, uh, of modularity to, to suit that. So once again, this is what we've done in Denmark. And for the Stanford project, which I think is important to understand, there's a lot of focus on the helicopter, but piloting this data management solution is also an integral part of the Stanford project. So it's not only about flying a helicopter, it's also about getting the data into a system, getting the helicopter data into it, and, and giving a sort of a framework that allows us to, to handle that in a proper way and also integrate uh, the state resources, state databases, and start providing these uh, reports and, and whatever we need to, to put up to, to the state. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this because that was... Just want to show you this. Finally, we have might be of interest to you support letters from the, the governor's office, from the state water board, and from the DWR for this project. So they're very interested in it, uh, and I can of course provide you uh, specific copies. You probably can read this, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see behind me. Of course, you all look uh, a little <laughs> awake. But, uh, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Before we go to the public for uh, questions, before we do, let's give a chance. Is there any board members that got a quick question before we uh, push this off the public? So, sir, if you'd stand or sit right there, we're going to have the public come up and they're going to ask some questions and make comments, and we'll give you an opportunity to respond to questions yes, they may have. If, it, if there are more of a technical man, I also have a technical expert with me. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Don Decker. Um, I have a uh, fairly compact set of questions. Uh, in reviewing the SkyTem papers that I could find readily, uh, what I did discover is that there is very little discussion about uh, basic data uh, reproducibility, accuracy, uh, precision of the measurements. Don, can you get closer to the microphone? Yes, I can. Thank you. This is a really touchy microphone. Um, <laughs> should I repeat, repeat what I just said? Sure, please. Please do. Um, in reviewing the uh, literature that I could find relating to SkyTem, I found very little discussion about uh, data reproducibility, accuracy, precision, you know, the kind of the fundamentals of what you start with. Uh, and I wondered if you guys uh, had any comments. I, I realize your talk today is a very high level, uh, but you might uh, point me in a direction that would be useful to explore what I just asked you. You know, the fields that you're inducing, the magnetic fields and then the currents that you're inducing are really, really tiny, and the uh, uh, native disturbances and all of the electromagnetic interference that exists in our modern world uh, is all competing with your uh, detector system's bandwidth, and how you do your initial discrimination and all, I'm sure, is proprietary to some extent, but the basic question is, what kind of accuracy, reproducibility do you actually obtain? In other words, how real ultimately is the uh, data that you show, that you, you know, that you obtain from these measurements? That, that's my question, and, and this is probably not the forum for any kind of a detailed discussion, but maybe you can point uh, myself and others who are interested in the subject to, to a a uh, set of papers or references that we can study more carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think we had a, a little discussion about the same topic uh, yesterday at the tech meeting. Before my, I'll let Max say some, just one, one comment I want to make is that um, it, it's always a question with geophysics is, you know, how do you validate what you cannot see? Uh, and I think it's what is important to say is that we, we, we spend a lot of time in each area we work in to verify the data according to what we know already from the lithology. 
uh, and the second is that it's this is a uh, I, I don't know the amount of line kilometers that are flown each year, but this is a very a mature technology, so it's something that is uh, applied across the world in uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers uh, each year. So it is it's not an sort of an experimental technology. But I, I don't know if there are specific articles about that. Yeah, my name is Max Helke. Um, I'll say it's a good question, John, and uh, very important when you want to map the groundwater aquifers here because it's very much in the details. Small errors can make a huge difference in how we do our interpretation of our our geology and hydrogeology. As a base, uh, the aquifer and the repeatability is within a few percentages, two, three percent. So if you're looking at mapping a depth to a practice water, as an example, you can do it pretty precise. Uh, and it's, then you should take into account that you get a whole coverage over so a general perspective. You also ask for papers. I'll be happy to provide you some papers that illustrate how that is done and also how we can demonstrate uh, our ability to repeat the data. Uh, and that's the same for anyone. Just uh, give me a notice and I'll be happy to look for the papers. Thanks, Thank you, Max. Appreciate it. So we're going to make sure at the end of this that we have the communication, the ability to follow up on these questions and uh, get these answers out. Next. Uh, good evening, Board. Mike Neal. I have uh, some amount of experience in these kind of measurements. I've worked for the base and done uh, a lot of antenna work and related kind of measurement activity in the past. Uh, from what I look around the room, I see three of us here in the room who, who have probably the ability to help advise uh, on possible application of these measures. I don't know where the board is thinking about going with it. They just want to get the information. Uh, but, uh, you know, getting it done, getting it done right, uh, you know, one of my major questions is what I saw in, in the papers that were, that were online was this is a very low frequency measurement. Getting much resolution of a low frequency measurement is uh, a little, my experience. So uh, I don't quite understand how they, they get very much res resolution. But uh, the, the overarching uh, thing that comes to my mind is, is, you know, what utility in the overarching scheme of things would, would this board get out of these measurements, uh, you know, in, in practicality? Uh, you know, it's nice to get all this sexy data and, and be so, oh, you know, we can see where all the water, you know, flows and where it's going and so forth and so on. You know, outside of, of a possible, you know, further chasing of the, the grand question of, of, you know, do we have an open or a closed basin, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, the purposes of this board, I, I'm kind of wondering whether they would be really very suited to even getting this kind of data because, uh, you know, what I see is basically we're just, Saying, oh, we have uh, we have wells going down. We got them down, going down, you know, a foot a year or whatever. And uh, California is telling us we need to stop that. Um, knowing all kinds of details about your basin, uh, like I said, unless you're you're going to determine once and for all that we've got an open basin, there's lots of water flowing in here, and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, if, unless you're chasing that question, uh, you're going to get a lot of data dumped. Uh, most of you guys are not, you're going to have trouble even understanding it, uh, to be honest. And, uh, you know, what overall good would we get out of it? I think you, you need to consult with your local technical experts here that are willing to help and, and even evaluating this question because I know these kind of measurements yeah. are not cheap. Uh, you know, you, they, they'll give you a lot of data, but you're also going to have to pay probably a considerable sum of money to get them. And, uh, what good you get out of that uh, needs to be thought through carefully, I think, before we even go on and spend the taxpayers' money, uh, you know, getting this stuff done. Thanks, sir. Good morning, board. Uh, maybe I can just uh, help provide a little. Speak name, please. Uh, Tim Parker, uh, groundwater consultant. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the water district, although I'm, I'm just uh, probably should have provided some upfront introduction to this to help everybody understand um, where this project is and, uh, 
and uh, a little background on Mr. Vind and Mr. Hawk here. So I met uh, Mr. Vind at a, uh, at a conference uh, in early 2016, and we started talking and uh, developed a bit of an understanding of uh, the Danish uh, where the Danes were with their groundwater program and got very interested. I was invited to a meeting at uh, another client's office uh, later that year and, uh, and, and got uh, really uh, an understanding of SkyTem. A, a parallel path, uh, Stanford was doing some pilot testing and actually had recommended SkyTem come over here uh, to this basin because of the a way it can rapidly acquire data very quickly and that it's a proven technology. So actually this has been discussed at the TAC and co-op meeting. Background on, um, wow this goes off and on, that, which you'll get some background on uh, uh, on the next uh, informational uh, talk, but really uh, this uh, started with uh, an interest in using geophysics with the brackish water study. And that was uh, a, a proposal that was developed actually a couple years ago and has then been enhanced. And so that's where the geophysics comes in is, is to provide uh, more information, better information on the subsurface to support the brackish water study. That study is being funded by uh, by the Brackish Water Study Group, and I think Wade will provide a little information on that. So this was really to provide information on this technology to the authority. It's going on sort of a separate track, and it would be funded by this co-op, I mean uh, Brackish Water Study Group. And uh, a little more background, I don't think uh, Jacob uh, mentioned that uh, the Danish government is entering into an MOU with the state of California, and they're signing that MOU on September 22nd. And this is really the Stanford uh, Architecture Project. The idea is that the state will uh, help fund that project. It's a $1.2 million project. $2.1 million project, three basins are involved, Indian Wells Valley is one of them. The state's going to provide a, a significant amount of funding, the Danish government will provide funding, and then the locals will split the other funding that's required for it. So this would be one of the first projects under this new MOU with the governor, the State Water Resources Control Board, and Department of Water Resources. So hopefully that provides a little more background on the project. Thank you, Mr. Pack. I have a quick question for you. Before you leave, because I thought Mr. Neal asked a poignant question. My understanding is that uh, these gentlemen's technology, Stanford, we were, were uh, collaborating with a bunch of folks, and the Brackish Water Study is um, uh, that, that organization is going to use the information to help develop an understanding of our aquifer and better define uh, the geology and the water of our aquifer. Right. Could you answer Mr. Neal's question in a, in a short two or three sentences? What value? is the information these guys are going to produce of, uh, to us in Sigma. In Sigma, okay, so you heard uh, uh, Mr. Vince say there's really three components to this, uh, to this project. It's data acquisition with the SkyTemp technology. It's producing a data management system and it's producing a revised hydrogeologic conceptual model. So the first thing that I would point out is it, that it will produce a data management system, and that's required under Sigma. That's something that then the authority can decide at some point whether they want to use that or develop another data management system, uh, because a lot of data will be loaded into it. Um, as far as the value of the data, it's going to fill in a lot of data gaps. When you, uh, typically when you do a, a groundwater study, and what's, a lot of what's been done here is putting in wells, so then you have a line of information here, here, and nothing in between. This geophysics will help fill in the information in between and have a bet, we'll have a better understanding, less uncertainty when we go down the road using models to look at alternatives for what we really need to do to come to sustainability in this basin. So, in other words, the mapping we use today to understand our aquifer, much similar to the presentation that Jacob showed us, once we get this technology done and, and data loaded, and, a, and a, we could have a completely redefined image and understanding of our aquifer as a, matter, as a result of this investment. 
Yes, we'll, we'll definitely have a refined understanding of the uh, aquifer system underlying this basin. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Next up, anybody? Oh, you got a question? I do, oh, okay. too. Oh, yeah. you have a question for? Well, no, I'll let them vote. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see you soon. I have a comment, Judy Decker. My comment is, I'm not a technical person, but what I picked up on is the Danes have open literature for the public. The public can acquire and understand and read about what is happening to their groundwater in their country. I applaud them for that and wish we had that here. Thank you, Ms. Decker. Next up. Okay, we got it. Come on up. Can I make just one more? Please come on up. I just wanted to add, because I didn't hear anybody say it, was that uh, co-op meeting is at two, right? And this dialogue will continue. There'll be an additional, more detailed presentation on SkyTem and more into the details. Uh, if you have more additional questions or want more clarification, so I would encourage uh, to come to the co-op meeting at two. Thanks, Ms. Pocket. You might want to sit right there, because we got some questions coming up, and they might be directed at you. Let's hope we're out of here by two. Uh, Mr. Page. Just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question was, the other thing Mr. Neal mentioned in terms of the value was the cost to taxpayers. And I heard Mr. Parker indicate that there's an MOU being developed between the state, Denmark, and local agencies, or maybe the local agencies aren't part of the, the MOU. He indicated that there's funding for whatever work's going to be done in this basin that will be shared by the state and by Denmark with a local share, and I didn't hear him say who was picking up the local share, whether this authority would be asked to come up with revenue for the local share of whatever study is done in this basin, or if members of the cooperative group have already agreed to fund the local share. I was, just wanted some clarification on that. Thanks, sir. Mr. Pack. So, so let me let me just break this down. So it's a two point one million dollar project and it's still being the funding's being developed. So number one, it's not a certain thing, but uh, but it's very optimistic and uh, and that it, and really what it's being looked at is uh, about seven hundred thousand dollars from the Danish government and about seven hundred thousand from the state, and then the locals would pick up the rest. And for this basin, uh, they're looking at a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, and it's just going to be uh, have to be uh, decided where that all ends up and how much state and and uh, Danish government funding is available. Number one. And then there may be some other opportunities to look at, like the grant application under Prop 1 might be another facet to look at for helping fund it. So that's out there. But uh, the locals that are looking at this are the Brackish Water Study Group have been talking about funding it and uh, have put some money on the table already and uh, funded actually the pilot, half of the pilot Stanford project. So that's the water district. COSO Geothermal, and uh, Searles Valley Minerals, and um, Mojave Pistachios. And so they've, uh, they've been uh, helping fund the Brackish Water Study and have put some money in for the geophysics uh, work. So not, the authority is not going to be asked to help fund this, is the bottom line. I sh could have said that first, but. <laughs> Mr. Page? Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Brown. Tim, um, uh, the cloud-based uh, data management system, is that something, um, I know that we all have our own models and our own data systems, and, and most of them aren't shared. Um, is the end game for California to emulate that to create a cloud-based data management system that everybody can feed or, or extract their Lego bits and and, uh, and in uniformity of data and the way it's collected, um, I'm assuming, well, you guys are the scientists, so it, depending on how it's collected, it's either good or bad or, you know, medium. Um, is that, is that, so is the end game to create the, 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 the same process, cloud-based, so 
so anybody could access that information based on their needs. Uh, I really liked your chart, by the way, where you had all these, this, this is your data set, here's what you can extract from it. Uh, it was very, it's a good graphic. Um, is that what, um, is, if, if and when we do this here, which I'm pretty sure we will, um, will that help with that, with that creation of that, or be a part of it? Well, I think uh, if, assuming this project goes forward, there would be a, a modular data system that, that could be available to do that. Regarding the state, um, you know, the state is a big, big state, uh, lots of moving pieces. But I would point out that AB 1755, the Open and Transparent Water Data Act, which was passed last year, requires that water data be made accessible. So the state's moving in that direction. I think part of the reason for this MOU with the governor's office is because the state's also, um, it's a struggle to get these kind of things done. So I can't really answer it that Yes, that's what the state wants because I think they're struggling with how they want to, what they want to look like when they grow up into the data transfer and management uh, arena. But yes, I think it, it would be uh, good to get there. And, and um, I think this, this particular project would really uh, be a, a step in the right direction to provide that framework for this valley. Yes, please. Uh, uh, one more question. Um, you're looking... You're looking down into the ground a thousand feet. Um, are there other things that you can um, assess or measure uh, besides uh, water that could be useful for other agencies and like the BLM or somebody or, or uh, you know, it, it seems like if you could look down into the ground and kind of, you know, like a big x-ray or MRI or something, you could learn a lot uh, that would help uh, maybe with future seismic studies or other things like that. Is that is can can more data be um, derived from that process? And if so, um, whoever could be the recipient of that, they could also be a, a potential funding um, body if if it could be used for more than just quantifying. I won't say just quantifying, but measuring water and water quality and things like that. Well, the, some of the objectives of the study are to uh, uh, get a better understanding of the lithologic profile. In other words, the, what, what are we looking at, sand, gravel, clay, et cetera, to, uh, to better understand some of the structures. One of the key things that we noticed with the DRI model when we talked with them was uh, as you come across 14, right before you make the right turn, there's that drop in terrain and water levels all kind of crunch up right there and we really, it's mapped as a fault by some, it's mapped as tight materials by others, but we don't, we, the model doesn't accurately uh, model that. So that's another area where we'd like to get some information, understanding how water is flowing uh, into the basin, how much is coming into the basin, so we get a better understanding on the geology and lithology along the edges of the basin. Those are some of the things we can uh, we can try to get out of it. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces in this basin right now, so we can we are going to continue this dialogue over at the co-op meeting if if we really want to get into more technical questions. Max, who's the expert on SkyTim and one of the co-founders of it, will be available. So. Uh, I, I would encourage that, the, uh, continuing the dialogue, and we can answer all your questions and, and provide uh, the, the, in, the uh, papers that, uh, that are out there. So don't go anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Kingsley. I'll just make a, one comment and maybe almost a yes or no question. First, I want to thank Mr. Neal for pointing out that the data may be too complicated for a lot of us up here, including me, and uh, I think it's important to set that bar low so that... We, there is not much expectation. Uh, I do point out that they're using uh, Lego blocks, which does help me quite a bit, uh, and I can relate to. Will the data help us um, understand recharge? And that's almost, you don't have to explain it much, but I mean, does, does that, I mean, I get the underground mapping part, but does it help us understand recharge? Well, um, so this was, uh, 
another study that's going on. So you, you may be aware that the USGS is part of the grant, Stress County's grant, that uh, Kern County applied for and I helped uh, put together for Kern County. Uh, the USGS, uh, and we had a call with them yesterday as part of the Brackish Water Resources Study to talk about uh, the recharge study and getting input on that. That will help us understand recharge, uh, the study they're doing, which is going to look at precipitation uh, going back 20 years and going forward 80 years, which will be then fed in to uh, help the, the model. Um, so that will help us with recharge. It's, it's gonna, they're looking at precipitation distribution uh, over the basin and the different types of geology, soil types, evapotranspiration. And they're also going to uh, help us uh, uh, design uh, the mon uh, what additional monitoring would be useful here in the basin, including additional weather stations, stream gauging if we need additional monitoring wells. So, uh, and that can go into a Prop 1 application in terms of a, a part of a GSP. The, um, in terms of actually this technology uh, helping us understand recharge, a lot, we can uh, certainly have a better understanding of the geology and how things connect and where water is coming into the basin and along, perhaps along mountain front recharge we may be able to develop some additional lithologic information to better understand that. One thing I really want to um, uh, kind of emphasize is this is just one tool in the toolbox. This. And as, uh, as we'll get into more detail later in the afternoon, uh, you know, the idea will be to use all the existing information, the hydrogeology information uh, in the basin as part of modeling the inversion to understand the lithology um, from the sky tem. So we would be using monitoring well information, the lithology from that, the, the geology from that, the water levels, uh, some of the water quality information can be used as well. So hopefully that helps answer. Don't go far. Yeah. Yes, sir. You may. I, yeah, it's closer to Lega. I can't do a yes or no, and neither could you. <laughs> uh, but I want to say that in Denmark, of course, we have uh, board directors and public uh, that are interested in groundwater as well. And part of the sort of the software package we're piloting in the Stanford project also includes some very uh, pedagogical uh, 3D modeling uh, tools that will allow you to fly through your subsurface terrain and see all the data in a very visual way that is easily understood both by public and, and non-technicians. So that's, that's, I didn't put too much emphasis on it, but it's actually not surprisingly we've had the same questions in Denmark just uh, some years ago, so we had the time to develop that, so that's part of it as well. Thank you, sir. Madam Mayor. I only have two questions. Uh, there was an inference made that this data may not be made available to the public. This is not proprietary data because there's public funding involved in it. Am I correct? Yes, and I don't recall that uh, that, that the statement was made that this... You uh, didn't make that statement. It, it, that, that I don't know. That, uh, well, I think uh, there's no intention of... Uh, doing anything but making this uh, data publicly available, it'll be on, uh, you know, the cloud, basically, okay. in, on the data management system. Okay, the second question, I was trying to infer from the information that you gave us from the studies that you had done in Denmark, uh, what, what actions you were able to accomplish based on the data that you were given and you found and the conclusions you drew as far as water management. That's a good question, uh, and I think the main reason I didn't go into it is that it's going to take uh, a long time okay. to answer. Short but the, question, short, long the answer. short answer is that, in terms of uh, sort of regulatory context, systemic complexity, Denmark and California are very different. So the, the measures we took were very different from what you can do because we don't have water rights for one. So, so we do a permission-based, uh, so a lot of the problems we solve through uh, revoking uh, well permits and stuff like that, and you cannot do that here. So that's why the main focus for us uh, and the message is that you need more info so you have a better understanding before you start making decision and decisions. And I don't really think that you can learn a lot from Denmark in the, 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 the following decision-making process because it's yeah, different. too different. Okay. Thank you. 
One last question for you, Mr. Parker. A dumb one, perhaps, but uh, would this result, end result of the study give us information as to where to where we would best have if we wanted a water bank some sometime down the road, where we could bank water? Would this help us make determinations on where are good locations and bad locations? Well, it'll be one piece of it. It'll help us uh, better understand the aquifer system, and that's a key issue. And it'll help refine the model uh, down the road, so that'll be a better modeling tool. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the, the other pieces of that, will, of course, would be conveyance uh, would need to be considered and the water source would be need, need to consider and how that would uh, get to where it needs to be. So, Thanks, sir. Uh, do we need a motion to receive and file or we just no. move on? No. Okay. Next up is uh, Pot B, which is the Brackish Groundwater Feasibility Study. Good morning, everyone. My morning. name is Wade Major. I work with a consulting company called Aqualogic, and we're working with a number of partners in the Indian Wells Valley on a brackish groundwater feasibility study. This morning, I'm going to walk you through a brief overview of our program as we envision it over the next 13 months. There are five members as part of the brackish water study group. We've got four funding members, the Indian Wells Valley Water District, Coastal Geothermal, Sears Valley Minerals, Mojave Pistachios, and we have the U.S. Navy as a participating member. Why are we looking at brackish water? There's only one source of water within the Indian Wells Valley, and that's groundwater. In 2015, these are the estimated quantities of groundwater that were pumped. You can see that we're looking at about 25,000 acre feet were pumped within that given year. Groundwater levels within the freshwater pumping zones are declining between a half and a foot and a half feet per year. There have been a number of geologists and folks uh, uh, outlining in the literature that estimates of safe yield for the Indian Wells Valley vary between 7,500 and 11,500 acre feet per year. You can see that there's a disconnect between 25,000 pumped in 2015 and what the safe yield estimates might be. The Sustainable Ground Groundwater Management Act obviously came, uh, came into force and became effective in early 2015. And the issue that we are looking at as part of the overall issue of water sustainability is the feasibility of brackish water development. Pumping of fresh groundwater in current areas will likely have to be reduced in order, in order for us to meet future sustainable yields. Therefore, there's a multi-pronged approach to water sustainability, and the component that we are examining is the development of the brackish water resources. We're going to need new water supplies in order to meet projected future demands. External supplies from folks like the State Water Project or the Colorado River are not accessible to this area. We've got brackish groundwater, that is water with total dissolved solids concentrations greater than 1,000 milligrams per liter that extend across at least half of the Indian Wells Valley Basin. So we are looking at potentially reducing fresh groundwater pumping and offsetting that with brackish groundwater pumping and treatment. We see a potential of between 9,000 and 15,000 acre feet per year of brackish water that could be developed. It will obviously require treatment to reduce the TDS concentrations, and clearly pumping of those brackish water resources cannot have an impact on the current freshwater resource, either in terms of groundwater levels or overall quality. We've got a, a map here that outlines total dissolved solids concentrations in the groundwater from some of the modeling and monitoring efforts that have gone on. The color-coded legend you can see in the bottom right, between zero and 500 uh, parts per million or milligrams per liter is the green. That is very typical of, of uh, drinking water, albeit a little bit on the salty side at 500 milligrams per liter. The yellow is uh, banded by 500 to 1,000, orange, 1,000 to 5,000, and greater than 5,000, that really brackish water you can see is further up uh, within the basin. 
Our overall objectives are to examine using the brackish groundwater as a supplemental source. We want to identify and quantify the results, the feasibility of development. Yes, they may be there, but can they economically be developed? What are the treatment and brine disposal options to minimize the overall capital and operational cost over the long term? And finally, uh, inland desalination projects face unique struggles, and that struggle is, what do you do with the brine? Brine disposal, brine reduction through a variety of means can be a very expensive method of, of dealing with those final residuals that come out of the reverse osmosis system. The unique attributes within the Indian Wells Valley is that there are a number of potential brine users. So you don't have to spend the additional incremental time, effort, and money to reduce that brine down to the minimum possible volume. You have two potential willing acceptors of that brine should that prove out in the feasibility study. A full-scale treatment concept is outlined here. The top three green boxes on the left identify where brackish groundwater resources may be within the basin. You can see we've got potential resources in the northeast, the east, and the southwest. Notionally right now, we're looking at potentially two possible treatment plants, one in the north, one in the northeast, one in the southeast. Those particular treatment plants would feed Brown Road Ag users as well as Inyo Kern and West Ridgecrest with the brine going to Coso Geothermal who will willingly accept that brine as water for use in their process. The Southeast Brackish Water Treatment Plant would provide uh, treated water to the United States Navy, Ridgecrest, possibly Trona, and possibly Sears Valley Minerals with the brine going to Sears Valley Minerals. An alternative shown with dashed lines, which uh, I, I hope the feasibility study, study doesn't force us in that direction, is using large-scale evaporation ponds to further concentrate the brine. The, the objective function of the feasibility study is to, to minimize the absolute capex and opex costs over the long term. And that will involve uh, a variety of, of trade-offs and balances and looking at the variables in terms of where to situate the plants, where to situate the brackish groundwater extraction wells, where to situate the pipelines, and how can we best deal with this holistically within the basin. We've got 11 main tasks as part of our scope of work. The first thing, we're hunting and gathering, basin resource evaluation. Available information on geometry, stratigraphy, hydraulic properties, inflow, outflow, quality, and the Salt Wells Valley. Looking at the two potential brine receiving facilities, Coastal Geothermal and Sears Valley. Identifying the data gaps. What do we know? Where do we know it? And more importantly, what don't we know? And what's it going to take to fill in those holes? And this ties in directly to the work that the USGS is doing on the recharge study and potentially the SkyTem work that may be executed in the future. Supplemental data collection, preparation of work plans will follow the, the data gap identification phase. We'll then look at the hydraulic feasibility. Where are the best locations to situate the extraction wells? What are the impacts from pumping from those wells to the fresh groundwater resources and overall water quality within the basin as simulated in the existing or future evolving DRI model? There's also another, uh, we'll be looking for unknown impacts. So, you know, as noted, we cannot have impacts on the freshwater resources in terms of quality or water levels. We may find in the DRI modeling with some additional data gaps filled that if we run uh, extraction wells further north in the basin, that we're seeing some unintended consequences elsewhere. We want to be able to identify that early in the modeling phase to make sure that we are indeed still on a feasible track. Treatment feasibility evaluation, we're going to look at existing studies that have been done and evaluate our current options for, again, minimizing the capex and the opex. Pipeline routing, a very critical factor in terms of where everything is situated, the plants, the pipelines, the wells, the disposal areas, design parameters, pipeline routing. All of that will be summarized within a feasibility report. We've got a demonstration plant conceptual design that is being prepared for Proposition 1 grant funding. Uh, 
currently underway and then potentially for implementation sometime later next year. Grant application, as noted, we're currently preparing uh, Proposition 1 grant funding. And then finally, just uh, trying to keep everything on the rails because this is a, a complex project with a lot of moving parts, a lot of interaction. So we've, we've got uh, project management meetings in, in order to, uh, to keep us focused and heading in the right direction over the next 13 months. Overall, what this is going to look like, uh, there's our main uh, 11 tasks. Apologies if this is uh, a bit tiny on the screen. But basically, uh, a lot of the tasks follow sequentially. We're building upon knowledge that, uh, that we gather in the early phases, with the exception of the grant applications. The preparation of those is, is currently underway. We're anticipating to have the feasibility study wrapped up by the end of next uh, April. And uh, thus far, you can see we're, we're midway through June, so we are well on our way in terms of understanding the basin resources, coastal geothermal, the demonstration plant conceptual design and our, our grant application work. Proposition 1 grant funding, we're, we're likely going to apply for two grants. One to assist us with the data collection. That will be uh, part of uh, what, what they know as their feasibility study grant application and a pilot study to actually go out and test either a single pass or a double pass closed circuit RO system through design pilot funding. We may or may not be required to uh, provide a funding match depending upon uh, some economic status data that we're digging into. If a funding match is required for the pilot study, we still have to determine what that mechanism might be. Now the final proposal solicitation package for Prop 1 was to be released on June 12th. I checked last night, I still did not uh, see it on their website. And grant applications, as they've noted, are tentatively due on, on July 31st, subject to DWR confirming the exact date. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, sir. We're sure we're going to have some, so if you grab a seat, uh, we'll uh, open this up for public uh, comments. Anybody in the public wishing to make a comment on what we just heard? Please keep your remarks. Pithy. I'm not quite sure what, I, what you said there at the last, Mr. Gleason, but... Uh, I said you look very handsome today, Don. Oh. <laughs> Does anybody have any clarification on what he actually did say? <laughs> Thank you, Mick. Uh, um, this, uh, there, there's an issue with um, brackish water extraction, uh, which has not been on anybody's charts that I've ever seen. And that is most of the high uh, TDS water, the brackish water in this valley, is associated with um, aquifer zones of high clay content. And if you dewater, um, you're going to have the potential of subsidence. And as part of, it may not be part of your statement of work, but there needs to be a careful evaluation of the impacts of subsidence. If it's in an area that is remote enough, the consequences might be actually pretty minimal, but um, depending on where it's at, uh, it might not be too. Uh, one of the areas of high TDS that is not on your map uh, was actually explored to a limited extent by the water district, and it's along the North Brown Road axis. And there is a rather substantial body, uh, maybe close to 2,000 feet, maybe even thicker in section of TDS water of about 3,000 parts per million. But that area is, ha has substantial development overlying, and it's, it's an example of an area that is really, I would think, problematic to dewater for the deeper brackish water. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Don, thank you for that great question and commentary. In, in fact, subsidence is one of the big concerns. While not listed explicitly, it does fall within the realm of, of other unknown impacts. So we are, we are certainly aware of the issues of, of dewatering uh, clay zones and the potential effects on subsidence. I know certainly that there are a number of constraints around the Naval Air Weapon Station where there is nothing that we are allowed to do that can possibly affect the mission. 
And so keeping those constraints in mind, we will certainly be mindful of, of subsidence in, in all of these regions. Um, as, as we are in the hunting and gathering phase, Don, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing a little bit more about that 3,000 TDS brackish down at about 2,000 feet in the Brown Road area that you've identified. Perhaps offline afterwards, you and I can chat and exchange information. We will, knowledge is an evolution, and we will gather as much existing information as we can because everybody has a different library. And so there's a lot of good stuff that we're, we're starting to see uh, coming out now, and we want to get that into the mix. So thank you, Don. Mr. Major, I got a question for you, a real quick one. The public hearing is still open. Uh, but my, my, we're going to have very quickly here, hopefully, a PAC established. And we're going to have a, that's going to be an extension of this board. It's going to be a committee that's going to be a policy oriented committee. Are they going to have an opportunity to shadow your work or participate or what type of level of relationship between your study and our, our existence can we exist? Can we develop? I cannot answer that. Um, I am, I am a low level civil engineer project manager trying to keep things on the rails. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I have not been privy to the larger picture in terms of interaction, sir. Got it. We'll, we'll work that. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Public open, it, but I mean, we're still open for questions. I see none, so I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Mr. Brown. So your last name's Major. I didn't know that. It is. Um, I was trying to remember um, last night the, the the name of the uh, company was Tetratech that did the seismic um, and, and the water intrusion mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So, if, if, if I'm sure the base, I'm sure it's an open uh, book because it was done for environmental stuff. So, Great. so Tetratech. Anyways, um, uh, you're talking about uh, single pass or double pass RO uh, technology. Now that's kind of uh, um, kind of off the shelf current technology. Or, or has there been any new developments? Because the RO process was energy intensive. And, I, and, um, and you're already familiar with what, the, what we did as, as a project, but we had a zero tailwater project, which the zero tailwater is what cost all the money um, by evaporating and, and, and creating the small footprint of brine. Uh, so so on, on your feasibility part, is, is, um, is there any new technology, lower energy technology or different uh, uh, technology to do that single pass or double pass RO where it's, uh, it's more energy efficient? Yes, currently the one that we're looking at is closed circuit single pass where you're actually recirculating um, a, a number of times that brine stream back into the front end of, of the RO system. You can uh, get much higher recoveries for a reasonable amount of energy expenditure. Since that previous study was done uh, back a number of years ago, if I recall correctly, the 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 primary desalting costs ended up around approximately $800 per acre foot, but the brine concentration costs themselves exceeded an additional $1,500 per foot. So when the smoke cleared, you're looking at over nearly $2,400 per acre foot to produce the water and deal with the brine. With the evolution in membrane technology over the past decade, past 50 years, we're anticipating that those overall costs should come down substantially from the work that has been done previously and with evolutions in, in technologies and, and tweaking the RO uh, treatment train to, to look at uh, closed circuit RO. Uh, 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 tailing on that, um, if, if that being the, the case, uh, it's very it's a lot more promising than the tw I always rounded up to twenty five hundred dollars an acre foot because I round everything up. <laughs> um, Having a person that would take the brine uh, uh, would totally offset um, your upfront costs, uh, and so that would make it even more appealing. So Th that is that is structuring the the financials of the overall deal in terms of capex and opex. Yes, absolutely. As, as I said at the beginning, inland desalting struggles because of what to do with the brine, and if you can eliminate that brine disposal cost to a, a willing acceptor, that significantly drives your overall treatment costs down. Yeah. So very promising from the standpoint of Indian Wells Valley being being a unique valley. Well, I really appreciate your chart uh, with the dotted lines and the solid lines. It was real easy to understand for us Lego guys, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mana. Hey, wait. Hello. Okay. 
Can you talk a little bit about the pilot project? What, what kind of scale are you talking about? Sure. The, the, the pilot scale we envision would be run at about 25 gallons per minute, not a significantly high flow rate. If we were looking at single pass RO with an 80% recovery, we would probably generate 20 gallons per minute of produced clean water and 5 gallons per minute of, of brine. We're anticipating, uh, we, we have thus far sketched out a, a treatment compound that's about 50 feet by about 30 feet. All of the widgetry that you would need for the, the pilot scale treatment plant would fit within that compound, not only the single pass, but if we truly want to look at, at double pass uh, for the sake of, of feasibility and evaluation, that would also fit within that compound. So we're looking at a footprint of 1,500 square feet uh, at a production rate of about 25 gallons per minute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? I have an economic one. The um, $2,500 acre, I mean $2,500 an acre foot, how does that make it economically sustainable and does the growth of it what do you, what what can we get it down to where it can be used for something other than just wow that's great we got it but how how does it become economical to use that kind of water at $2500 an acre foot it is not economical for anybody other than perhaps if you were sending it to the International Space Station. That's expensive water to produce and it would be expensive to lift into orbit. Um, but in all seriousness, if, if you can eliminate the brine disposal cost, we're anticipating driving that primary desalting cost down. I don't want to speak at this point in time, but you may be looking at 400 to $500 an acre foot and then dealing with with a, a, a brine recipient after that fact. But again, this is early days in the feasibility study. I will not hang my hat on those numbers, but, but those are the kinds of numbers that you're seeing, seeing for a very simple single pass RO where you don't have to deal with the brine. Okay. Is there any great user of brine in the world? Uh, Who we could? Pickles. Pickles. <laughs> right. right. That's called, I, you know, called Velasic, huh? I, 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 again, it's the, it's the transport cost at 10 pounds per gallon to, to ship the stuff around either in a, a truck or a pipeline or, or some manner of, of dealing with it. It's, it's a real struggle to deal with it um, when, you're, when you're not on, in a coastal environment. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mr. Major, is this brief available to the public? Uh, sure. So, are they, how do they get to hold this? Brief? Oh, I will. Uh, will somehow make provisions to do that. We we have not currently set up a, a, a project sharing site yet, but uh, we'll make provisions to get it into the public realm. Outstanding. That'd be a big help. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Well, I'll just, I'll just mention that there is a user. There is some users of brine, and it's in dust control. There's some work on that right now. Um, <clears throat> The uh, Salton Sea might end up being one. The Owens Dry Lake is doing some work on uh, use of brine for dust control. Yep. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Mr. Major. Thank you, sir. Moving on, uh, we are now up to the uh, item five, consent agenda. Items may, may be removed, the consent agenda uh, by the board. Is any member of the public wishing to make comment on the consent agenda, which is it six of one, ish, one item? which is the approved minutes of board meeting May 18th, 2017. Anybody wish to make comment on that? Seeing none, we close that. Bring it back to the board for motion and approval. I'll make a motion to approve. All second. All, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that passes unanimous. Moving then to item number six, which is review applications, make appointments for the policy advisory committee. Mr. Christensen. Thank you. Is that one working? Doesn't sound like it. Is it kind of? Okay, I guess it's working kind of. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, Alan Christensen, uh, here to report on um, appointments to the Policy Advisory Committee. Um, uh, at, at previous meetings, we've discussed this. In fact, uh, let me take you through uh, some of the history here. Um, 
uh, once we decided the the makeup of the the pack, uh, which is a 13 member board, uh, we provided applications online uh, for folks in the community to uh, submit their application. Um, we put an ad advertisement in the newspaper uh, and in, uh, provided a deadline, deadline of early June for applications. Thanks. In, in total, we received 20 applications. That includes the applications from the persons that had already been appointed um, back in, I think, April 28th, our, uh, uh, the uh, workshop we had over at, uh, at the hotel uh, where we appointed uh, some, uh, some individuals. So we had 20 applications. Um, I think at the last meeting, your uh, your board decided that an ad hoc committee would consider the applicants. Uh, they have done that. Uh, and uh, let me read. Um, let me read. First of all, let me read the 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 list of the persons that have already been appointed uh, previously uh, for large. Large Agriculture, Rodney Stiefvater. For Large Agriculture, Edward in, Imsand. East, uh, the seat for the East Kern County uh, Res Resource Conservation District, Donna Thomas. Uh, wholesaler and industrial user, Steve Goddard. Uh, and then the non-voting members from the uh, Indian Valley, Valley, Valley Water District, Don Zadiba. The Department of the Navy, Brian Longbottom, and the Bureau of Land Management, Ryan Klausch. Uh, the uh, ad hoc committee has recommended the following individuals be appointed. For small agriculture, Pat Patricia Quist. For business interests, Carol Wilson. Uh, for the other business interests slot, uh, Scott O'Neill. For residential customers of a public water agency, Nick Panzer for uh, domestic well owners, the first slot going to West uh, Katzenstein, and for the second slot for domestic well owners, Lyle Fisher. Um, assuming that your board um, is uh, in approval, we have a resolution that uh, will add these names. This, uh, this list will be Exhibit A, and uh, uh, if you choose to do so, we ask uh, recommend that you... Um, Whatever you decide to do, that you uh, adopt the resolution with the names of those individuals uh, that are ultimately on the pack. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. We have one from the mayor. I uh, would like to thank all the people, all the people who applied. It was a very difficult decision. And let me share a little bit about the process. Um, we each chose separately. I was kind of surprised when when I saw we changed then saying, I, I like this person, I think this person will do a great job, and we were unanimous in our selection. And I just, it was not easily done. I felt like I knew every one of you well. I knew your heart, and there was no reflection if you were not chosen, uh, no reflection on your ability to serve or your willingness, nor your knowledge. But I wanted to make sure that at least my selection was representative of a wide variety of options and choices that we have here. And that was my reason for choosing the people I s selected and presented to uh, the chairman. Thank you, Mayor. I'll jump on that and say uh, real quick uh, before we go to the public for a comment is that uh, this, is th this is a time for all hands on deck. It's a privilege and an honor to be on this committee, but that doesn't mean that anybody who applied that was not selected is not going to have an opportunity to take a role in development of where we're going and what we're doing. This is a full-throated community effort. Uh, this is a structure that was designed uh, in accordance with our, um, our plan, and so we had to pick somebody. Although we had uh, several good applications, uh, it was like you know, sometimes you like to say, you, know, you want beef or you want chicken. And you just, you got to make a selection. So we did. Nobody here, uh, all, the, all the applicants were outstanding, and I was thrilled that they all applied. And I want to thank each and every one of them, whether they, whether they are on this list or not, for applying. And if you were not on this list and you did apply, that does not mean that you don't have access to uh, continue helping in the development of our plan and our future. One more thing. Go ahead. Uh, 
we announced Carol Wilson. Actually, it was a board of realtors, and Carol Wilson was selected by them should they be accepted to be their representative. So she isn't. It was the board who was asked to be the on that committee. Right, correct. And, and in most of these cases, you need an actual physical belly button to be appointed to the board and not a, not a group. Okay, uh, so, a yes, sir. I could just ask for a clarification on, on the uh, procedure. <clears throat> um, I see a recommendation for one residential customer of a public water agency. Um, in our bylaws, we have two seats for that. Does that mean that we only had one application for that, or you're only recommending that one of those two seats be filled? Public water, we had... <laughs> You had two, didn't you? We had three applicants. Three? Um, you, you did have three. So you, you had more than one. Um, I, I guess, I'm sorry, we, we, I was under the impression, we may have made a mistake, I was under the impression we only had one appointment. So My, my recollection of the bylaws is there's the two, two, residential, two, two, custom, two residential customers of public water agency. Oh, okay. oh. Is my recollection of Article 5. We can find out real quick. Oh, we're going to find out real quick. As we do that, uh, let's study that and let's open the public for uh, public hearing. Is that okay, mm -hmm. Mr. Page? Yes. Uh -huh. I think so, yeah. There's two? Okay, so uh, we've Sorry. got an additional slot uh, to fill. See, it looks like. And let's open the public hearing for a comment and consideration. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Page. Mr. Chair, Donna Hawker, Ridgecrest Area Association of Realtors. Just a quick clarification. We do have an alternate Realtor, in case Carol Wilson is not able to make one of the meetings. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessary to get that name on the record, but we do have Rita Reed as our alternate. Thanks. Thank you. Any other public comment? My name is Sophia Merck, and I believe that there was an alternate that was support, appointed through Eastern Kern County RCD, and that was um, Stan. I can never pronounce his last name, <laughs> but everybody knows Stan, so he's also an alternate. Thank you. Any other comment? It's a big one. Okay. I, I, I do have, a, I, I guess, a question on... We, is your question while the public is open or closed? Oh, either way. Doesn't matter. Let's close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for common consideration. Um, on, on, we, we ran into this recently on, um, on some of our committee selections, is whether alternates um, were designated and then allowed to vote, if these are voting members. So I don't know if we have address that, but it might be something we want to consider, uh, because what happens is, is it, uh, it, it, it turns out to be a question at some point, is whether the alternate, uh, whether all of these can appoint alternates, and then whether they are voting alternates or not. Thank you. That is a good question, because if the alternate has not been attending the meetings, and the time a question comes up for the vote, the alternate's knowledge, unless it's the, the, the original has shared well and fully with the alternate, is based on limited knowledge. How do we accomplish that? How is it done elsewhere? Um, in, the, in the bylaws, we have no, um, we have no, nothing, it is silent on the issue of um, alternates. So, for that, it, probably for the same reason that you mentioned, because because of the time involved. So um, w I have received communications from certain individuals about you know their their assigned alternates, um, but w we did not address that uh, in the uh, bylaws. Thank you, Mr. Christians. I think, and I re recall back, we, we did not bring it into the bylaws specifically for good reason because we wanted people there to have, you know, they were the ones who were going to be responsible for representing their particular group, and we didn't want delegates. 
So we were driving toward that uh, that particular idea. Okay. Uh, any other comments? <laughs> They have reports, forms 700s, they have, there's like, it's complicated. It's not just like, oh, you're the ultimate. What did she say? Yeah. Uh, that, that's true. It, I mean, one of the reasons it was discussed that we, we didn't do alternates was we wanted to make sure people were there. We wanted to make sure that somebody's there for all the meetings, has all of the knowledge. And if you're an alternate, you're going to be filing Form 700s and, and all of the stuff that follows with that. And maybe or may not be at a meeting and may or may not ever vote, depending on whether or not the primary member was absent someday. So there's a lot that falls with having alternates. So it wasn't put in. Thank you. Mr. Christensen. Um, Mr. Chair, I, we may have said this before, but for, sometimes we use acronyms and, and uh, things that the public doesn't, under, doesn't always get, but uh, Form 700 means you get to report your, uh, your income in, in many cases. Uh, if there are any uh, gifts that are given to you uh, that might be, that uh, present a conflict, um, and so uh, just, just know that. Let's um, ask. In addition, well, we checked the bylaws. There is two, seat, two seats or two uh, identified positions. You are correct. Our mistake. So we do have one more open position for the um, uh, for the what, what's what do we call it? Residential the customers. Customers of a public wa water agency. So uh, we do have one one additional opening. I can give you the names of those uh, persons. Uh, the the two additional persons that had applied for that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Renee Westa Lusk and Teresa Sizemore were the other two. Is there a residency requirement that they live in the Indian Wells Valley or live in the basin? Well, they, for this position, they wouldn't be a residential customer of a water district if they weren't in the, living in the basin. So, so for some of them, there you can. For example, large ag. You can just be a landowner and live elsewhere, but for that particular item, to be a residential customer of a public water agency, you obviously have to have a residence. So it's that one is very specific. But she asked if she asked if the basin. I think it's if they're a residential customer getting a beneficial use of water from the basin. Yeah, I, I guess I should expand to that. If you lived in Trona, you would also fit with them. So okay, sorry, that's the question the, I was yes, asking. That, that is true, and okay. it's something we had discussed. Good choice. Good choice. All right, I'm going to uh, make my recommendation a, a person who has been to all the meetings, many of the meetings, has, has a, a record of attendance and uh, has making comments and is, again, no reflection on the other person, but I would like to then add Renee to that list. I'll, I'll agree with that. And so the recommendation uh, that your Exhibit A looking at would include the name of Renee Westerlusk as a second member of the residential customers of the public water agency. So what we need to do is have a conversation here in the board on uh, whether this recommendation is uh, what you agree with. And what are you willing to vote for? Yes, sir. The, I, I think I indicated I had two questions before. The, the second question I had was we have a requirement in the bylaws to that one of these 11 voting members, um, once appointed, must have an additional representation of a disadvantaged community. Uh, and I'm wondering whether, um, based on the rec based either on the prior appointments or on the new recommended appointments from the subcommittee, whether there is a representative of a disadvantaged community in that group. That applied. I, I do not believe, uh, Mr. Chair, through the chair, I do not believe that was disclosed. Uh, I, I didn't notice uh, that in the application. But I'm sure if the applicants uh, are here, they might be able to correct that that information. But I did not see any. It's so like, for instance, there are areas of Inyo Kern, I believe, that are uh, a disadvantaged community. Uh, but I did not see uh, see that disclosed. On that subject, um, Cyril's Valley Mineral would also fit within the disadvantaged community because it is designed for somebody who is conducting business. They are the wholesaler 
to the public water agency out there, which uh, is serving the disadvantaged community. So they would fit within that also. You would not just need to have a individual serials fits in. I have to say though, that sounds like you're trying to stuff an elephant in a yeah. in a little a little box. Um, I don't think so because Cyril's is going to have multiple things here. Cyril's has its mineral business, and Cyril's is operating oh, as a regulated right. public You're utility. Right. You're right. So, I'm I mean, sorry. I think as far as the disadvantaged community representation, that they're already in that that game. Um, so, I mean, I understand that that's a lot for them to take on, but but they've kind of already taken it on. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I appreciate that explanation from our, our council. Um, I think it would be good to know, though, whether any of these other people would um, either live as a residential customer or in other ways might serve a disadvantaged community, because I believe it would help with our Prop 1 application to be able to show that we have addressed that issue and that we're considering the interest of those communities. Um, point. That's a good point. So uh, let's do this. Let's. I, I don't want to uh, glaze over this. I want to really flesh this out. I want a good understanding of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it, and doing it properly. So can we move forward on this list and bring back uh, a review at the next meeting to include a conversation on whether or not we want to add that specific line item, I'm specifically disadvantaged community, with enlist that member to that to that. Uh, uh, association. Would that be, Mr. Page? That's a good idea for you? Okay. Yeah, that, that works since we do have, we've met the requirement of the bylaws um, with Searles Valley Minerals prior appointment, but I think it is, that will work going forward to have a better understanding of, of exactly how much representation disadvantaged communities have. Thanks. Uh, on that point, the, this resolution and this pack can be modified as you wish, so next month you could add more if you wish or, or not. So, um, it is actually designed to be something that you can change in the future. There's Great. nothing I just don't yourself want to, in today. Thank you. I just don't want to gloss over it because I think it's an important point, and I think uh, we've done so great. We've paid attention to all the details so far. Let's, let's continue to focus and get it right. So, uh, for, for, clar for clarification, are you saying that you want to hold off on the second appointment to the no. resident? No, you want to go forward with that. But you want us to flesh out the the issue of disadvantaged communities and representation from there, right? Okay. All right. You know, we've got an opinion from council that we've met our requirement of our bylaw regarding having somebody in that eleven voting members that represents or serves a disadvantaged community. But I think it's, it helps our position in grant application funding. To know exactly how much representation amongst those amongst those eleven, I'm not saying we have to add a seat for it. That amongst those eleven, either reside within a disadvantaged community uh, or provide services to a disadvantaged community. It, it, just to sort of add on what I was saying earlier, when we were setting this up, thinking in the abstract, not having applications in front of me, the, the disadvantaged communities out here are fairly small. I wasn't sure if we would get somebody from those. I couldn't ensure we were going to get somebody from those. And with Trona representing what is a disadvantaged community because it's providing water service to that whole community, uh, we set this up so that we could get that coverage. Okay. We're getting ready to have a vote. Unless there's something coming up here. Yeah. Right. I would suggest you hold off on that last appointment. We need to double check. I don't have the applications with me, but we need to double check some information on some applications. Okay. So we, my recommendation for you is to is to appoint what what we have what you your ad hoc committee has uh, recommended, um, and we would come back at the next meeting with another with a, and deal with the, that that additional name in addition to the. Um, in addition to the uh, disadvantaged community uh, representation, um, I just I, we just need to we haven't had a chance to go back and review since there was an additional uh, slot, and I just don't feel comfortable that we that we have all the eyes dotted and the T's crossed. If you know what I mean. Okay, got it, Mr. Summers. You sitting there for a reason? 
Ms. Thomas? Donna yes, Summers. I just wanted to ask a do, point do, of okay. clarification. What I'm going to do, hold on a second, hold on. What, what I'm okay. going to do, the public here, public prop has already been closed, but I'll reopen for, I see there's a couple ladies up there, if you'd please be uh, okay. concise in your comments. Okay. Um, I feel that Eastern Kern RCD um, covers within our boundaries the Inyo Kern Community Service District. So just for a point of clarification, do we write a letter stating that um, provision or, or how would we handle that? We'll, we'll get the answer to you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Just a couple of things, and while we're on the disadvantaged communities um, uh, thought, uh, put us in a better position for grant money by expanding that, by including the community services district, uh, because there's money available and a lot more accessible for disadvantaged communities. Just a thought. I don't know if that would have put us in a better position or not. Um, on the uh, subject of alternates having uh, the ability to vote, I don't know, maybe I need better clarification on what what advantage there is in having an alternate if they can't vote and the GSA has board members have alternates, would there be a difference in um, the board and a committee just considering that we might want to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ferris. Please speak your name, too. Sam. My name is Sophia Merck. I would also like to bring up disadvantaged communities uh, in regards to Pearsonville. I believe that that might apply, to in regards to Inyo County. Uh, maybe um, Supervisor... Uh, Kingsley. Matt, I couldn't think of your last name. I'm sorry. I just know you as Matt. Um, but maybe perhaps he could do an outreach to, to that community. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a comment on your process. And, you, and your name? Judy Decker. Thank you, Judy. Sorry. Um, I was told that I could only apply for one position. It just so happens I fill four. I'm a private well owner. I'm a, I'm a customer of Ridgecrest and a resident of the city. Excuse me all the heck, three. And according to the boundaries I know of for disadvantaged communities, I also fit within those boundaries. I, I had to choose between applying as an individual for the PAC or being an alternate because I was voted originally as the alternate for the EKRCD. And it seems to me that you are limiting yourself by doing something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have had a discussion. I think we're complete with our conversation, and I need a motion of some sort that captures all the conversation or further discussion. Uh, um, well, I, actually, I would make the motion that we adopt Exhibit A as you've uh, detailed it today. I, I think it's actually adopting the resolution, which Exhibit A is the exhibit to the resolution. Okay. Whatever you just said sounds good. I'll make that motion. <laughs> I, I will second that we adopt the resolution with Exhibit A as originally presented with only one residential customer. Now, do we need to add to that motion that we're going to come back next week with a discussion of uh, disadvantaged communities, or is this motion okay? We'll just come back with agendize it next week. You don't need to. You don't need that part of the motion. We we've got that direction. Okay. Cool. We have a motion, and I'm looking for a second. No, no, it's, it's a second. Oh, yeah. we got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have a pack. Thank you very much. Okay, we get some discussion of uh, item seven is discussion of revenue issues and concerns. 
Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, let me, for the record, go back to that item. Uh, we are using, re this will be resolution number 01-17. That's identified in the uh, the board, the staff report. Uh, the, the information on the uh, resolution itself in the packet is incorrect. So it's 01-17. Here it says 2017-03. That's my, that's my point. It, it's... We're not using that number. We're using 001-17. Okay. Yeah. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I put this item on uh, the agenda because uh, we've had this discussion before. Um, you're nearing uh, decisions about uh, hiring an attorney, uh, a special counsel attorney for water and groundwater. You're also uh, nearing a decision about uh, a water resources manager, and uh, it's um, it's important that we have an understanding uh, as much as we can about um, resources to pay for that. We're a new agency. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have some revenue sources. We've talked about those. I'll go over those in a moment. Um, it, but it's a complicated uh, matter. You have uh, in your bank account $75,000. We haven't touched any of that. That, that, was, your, that was five agencies contributing $15,000. Um, the authority has a, secured a grant to the state for $250,000. I think roughly 90000 of that is committed to the uh, recharge study. Is that, is that correct, 90000 Did I get that number right? Um, and uh, so you have some other, uh, some other funding from the grant um, for GSP-related things, but you have some uh, limitations to that. For instance, you can't, cannot, uh, or I, I can't confirm that you can use uh, grant funds to pay for uh, attorney to review or to review documents. Uh, and so uh, you're limited, you know, some of these funding sources, you can't just put them in one big pot and use them for whatever you want to, there are some limitations to, to doing that. I'm not saying that couldn't be, that couldn't be modified with the state, but right now um, there are some limitations to that. Um, and, and, and your costs for um, attorneys, uh, for attorney work will be, could be significant, uh, especially as you get towards uh, a GSP document, but even, Earlier than that, uh, attorneys are expensive. Um, there is an additional, uh, you know, there's an additional funding source. Prop 1 funds are coming the second round. We hear that, that up to a million dollars would be available to uh, each critically overdrafted basin. That's good news. Um, uh, we haven't heard definitively yet whether that uh, when they say up to, if that means that because you're critically overdrafted, doesn't matter how big you are, you get, uh, you get, you might be entitled to a million dollars. Uh, we will be aggressively pursuing that. My sense is that those funds will not be available till mid uh, first part or mid uh, 2018. So. Um, uh, as you hire a water resources manager, uh, you will be expending money almost immediately, and uh, that could be over the next year, hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. So um, I know that I'm, your heads are probably swimming with different uh, numbers, but um, the the GSP itself could cost uh, um, anywhere from a half a million to a million dollars. Um, again, we don't know exactly yet, uh, we have, but we have some parameters. Um, but ultimately, um, we need some other funding sources. Uh, the two options, as I identified in the report, is that you could um, receive a loan of some kind from a, from an, uh, a benefactor agency that was willing to perhaps front some money uh, in anticipation of paying it back later, uh, or a contribution. Uh, there could be some private contributions um, that we have talked about that. Perhaps some of the um, uh, major pumpers uh, would be willing to contribute. Um, we have not had those discussions yet. And then the third is to assess, assess um, 
property owners in some way, whether it be through uh, those that pump or, uh, or some kind of uh, tiered system. So uh, I, I'm interested in your thoughts and feedback, uh, direction, uh, but I would recommend that we come back at the next meeting, if possible, with, uh, I really do believe that we need a, a, a consultant to advise you on what revenue uh, assessment options you have. Um, so someone that's experienced in Prop 218 uh, uh, rules that can advise you on uh, the different paths you can go down, someone that can, uh, uh, with some legal uh, foundation or has some legal support that can help you uh, make some decisions. And so we would like to, and, and I would pay for that. I would recommend we pay for that out of the 75. We try to limit that amount. But uh, that is our that is staff's plan because we think we have to get um, on firmer financial ground in order to uh, in order to do much more. Uh, we're making progress, but um, I can see I, I'm a I'm a anticipator. That's that's what I, I you know my wife some set. She says I, I can rain on her parade a lot, and but that's what I do. You know, that's what I've been trained to do, and so I can see down the road towards the end of this year us, you know, being uh, uh, saying where's where's the money. So with that, uh, I'm willing to take some feedback. But that's th those are my thoughts. So did you just take ten minutes to say that we're broke? <laughs> we're not broke. We're just okay. heading down a path. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was hoping that staff might be able to, to clarify something for me. Um, they mentioned as one potential source of additional funding for this authority as we move forward on developing our GSP um, with the community is to pursue a second uh, round of Prop 1 funding um, that is specifically set aside for this kind of process. I was wondering if that pot of money that's being made available, and, and I understand from the uh, communication that comes out of the state that there's actually going to be money available for critically overdrafted and money available for others. Um, is that pot of money separate from the pot of money we heard earlier this morning that the um, cooperative group and the Brackish Water Feasibility Study is going to be applying for? Or are we going to be competing with them? For the same pot of money, I have the same question through your, through your chair. I had the same question. I only assume that we're not competing with it. I know there are multiple pots of money, um, but because 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 when you compete for money out of the same basin, that's not good. The state's no, not going to appreciate no. that. It, it it needs to be coordinated. Um, if if we are talking about the same funding source, it does need to be coordinated. Uh, we we shouldn't. In fact, I know most state agencies I've worked with, and I think DWR, like to have a coordinated grant plan. All the agencies on board holding hands saying this is what we'd like to do. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll get that information. And I don't know if those folks know. I don't know particularly what their thoughts are. So, okay, Thank you. Commander? Uh, I didn't want to interrupt Alan when he started, but did we skip over 6C and 6D? Yeah, we did. We're okay. going to go back to that. Oh, my, that was sorry. my fault. But let's continue on with this conversation here, revenue issues. I'm seven. I'd like to ask a question. The, you talked about um, major pumpers donating money. How is that accomplished, and how is it accomplished where it does not appear that somebody is trying to buy an accommodation. I mean, I understand what I understand. There's already been some who have made major donations, and I don't look at it askew at all, and I'm grateful for it. But I, I want to see if there's a way to we can talk about that where they are not viewed as purchasing a right. I, I can offer an opinion. I'm sure Mr. Hall has seen some of these kind of situations. But, uh, for instance, in, in the development, in a city's development, oftentimes a city or a county uh, would have a, a development plan come forward. It's significant. It's large. And uh, there's an EIR 
uh, associated with it. And the, the city or the county would say, well, uh, you need to pay for that EIR. Well, the city or the county doesn't allow, typically would not allow that city or county to go out and hire their own. What they would do is say, uh, we're, we're going to ask for some money on deposit, and we're going and we're going to use your money to, to to do an independent process and look at an independent person, so it's not their guy or girl or whatever or firm. And so that's a that's a way to sort of that's a method to. Uh, Make the money available, but but more in an in independent way. Perhaps there's a way to do that here, where if they can, they they you could discuss contributing for a certain purpose, or if it's a consultant uh, project that could be identified that was separate and distinct uh, from uh, that where uh, where you could procure it in a way that is independent, where you know you you go through a process and it, it's it's sort of like a like we've done, uh, you've seen done in your agencies. So that's, I guess that's sort of a way, that would be my first blush, but I haven't thought through completely. I guess I don't want any of those people willing to donate multi-millions of dollars to think that they're going to be looked upon in a bad light. I want them to understand and us to understand we're all in this together and that we either help each other and make it happen or we're not going to succeed. And not succeeding and not be having the ability to grow and not having the ability to address economic development in this community is not an option I'm willing to look at. So I want to find a way that we can do that. Now, equally, when you talked about um, fees or or on, on wells, um, meters on wells, what is, I would like us to somehow address that and how those how those things happen. I mean, we just don't go up and say, okay, we're going to charge everybody $100 a year for the use of their well. How do we do that? What does that happen? Because that's part of this revenue source that is going to happen some way, somehow, sometime. Okay. I could... I would rather... Um wait to, to have someone uh, give you an answer that I think and the public an answer that is that is better um, than just off the cuff okay. um, but but I think then can we put it on the agenda absolutely thank absolutely. you Mr. Brown um, um, we talked about this um, at our board meetings because uh, we're one of the three big water uh, producers um, anyways um, one suggestion that, that came up with our board um, was maybe uh, this, we could form a finance committee uh, because it's difficult to discuss a lot of uh, subject matter up here uh, it once a month. And, and maybe a smaller committee uh, could start to navigate this. And, and, and we could address budget issues, uh, current costs, uh, projected future costs, those kinds of things. Um, I, I, I do understand that uh, Kern County, you guys uh, right now, um, your treasurer, your finances um, have um, is the money's parked there. What we have, um, we could start with that, and then look at how else could we supplement ourselves by you know these grant applications. Um, uh, the, uh, we, our board also discussed that we would help fund uh, maybe a, um, a coordinator or, or something to help. Uh, kind of get this thing off the ground and give us time to, to get organized. So uh, we, we've already made that offer, but I, I can reiterate that. But we would also like to maybe uh, visit uh, forming a finance committee to start addressing just the, just the money issues all by themselves. Thanks, sir. Appreciate your thoughts on that. i got a couple things. Uh, one of the things that um, I have here is a list of uh, assignments that I was ready to task the pack before we closed the meeting today. And it was, uh, it just taught, one of them was, the reason I asked about the coordination between the Bracker study and the pack was uh, understanding that uh, we want to avoid the, this competition. We want to coordinate rather than compete. And uh, so I was, uh, one of the assignments I was going to assign the pack is to coordinate um, Prop 1 funding priorities. So uh, maybe we can, we can go that way. I, I also like the idea of a finance committee. And I think the finance committee can also leverage uh, the PAC 
and to uh, use the resources they have, the, the talents they have there to help us uh, come up with some type of uh, understanding of uh, the landscape and availabilities and opportunities for funds and what, what funds we need and where we can get them. So um, well, I guess now now would be a good time for me to, 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 to sign priorities for the TAC the way that I, I would like to do that. Could uh, I'll just make a comment on the financing. Um, I, I believe you talked about a consultant to look at at uh, ways to for fees and pumping, and, and I didn't hear anybody mention that. But I do think that I mean at some point we're going to need to gather that information, uh, and I don't know if that's now or later. But uh, if that if that's I mean, if that is the ultimate funding mechanism for this, I mean, it's not going to be grants forever. So even if we're going to get grants to get us there, I think that's important. But uh, if that's a if that's going to be the ultimate funding mechanism, I do think that gathering information on how we're going to do that could be important. And and you know, you mentioned you know just assessing fees. I think that's not going to be a very comfortable position without. Uh, information from some other source. So, and, and uh, thank you. Sometimes I'm direct and I don't um, clarify it. I don't want to get the impression that I'm suggesting that with it that you know in two months we need to have a pump fee. <laughs> I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we just need to start. I, I this does take a long time. There's outreach. There's educating the public, there's getting feedback from the public, there's uh, you understanding what you're getting into before you even send it out to the public. So it does take some time, and depending on how you do it, we do have deadlines to get, if it's, in a, if it's a tax assessment, it does take time. So um, that is my desire, not to, not to push an assessment, but to get, because if you understand an assessment and you decide you like it or you don't like it or you, that may influence how, what other sources you pursue. So anyway, just clear. Thanks, Christian. Mr. Brown. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'd like to make a motion that we uh, form a finance committee. Do you have anybody in, in mind? I, I think Mr. Page volunteered, um, and I, I could a volunteer as well if he buys lunch occasionally. I would do that. All right. Okay, so. Uh, we have a motion to form a finance committee. Oh, we have a motion to form a finance committee. Uh, I will second that. And we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is it on the agenda? Go ahead. We need to clarify. Are we speaking a standing or an ad hoc committee? At this stage, it would probably be preferable to have an ad hoc committee because with a standing committee, you're going to have to agendize it. You're going to have to be in the same room, et cetera. Oh, and well, on a Brown Act, couldn't I... Do it remotely as long as my location is available to the public. No, because you wouldn't get a quorum number. You're gonna have a quorum in the we'll just call location. It. So uh, by agendizing it as an ad hoc committee, it makes it easier for you to speak to legal counsel on issues. Um, but that doesn't mean that when it's not time for you to do things in open that you can't agendize and have that meeting. Uh, also, I would say that as you're doing this, you need to task this committee to a specific purpose, which is to look at, at upcoming revenue streams and possibilities only. Thank you, sir. We also have not gone to the public yet. So uh, before we have that vote, let's uh, open the public comment. Before we have that vote, we have to do Judy Decker, I have two comments. I commend you, Peter, on wanting to form a finance committee. I recall saying to you many months ago that you needed to form some committees. Uh, I think you're past due. As far as finances, this is a water issue. It should be based on water consumption, not a property tax assessment. Uh, Eventually, everybody will have a meter. The water district already has the capability of assessing their customers for the purpose of funding their share of this. Uh, large AGS needs to have meters that are red, and they should. Be, it should be based on 
How much water you use, not the state of your property. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. It's still morning by my watch. Um, my name is Derek Hoffman, legal counsel from Meadowbrook. And first, I want to thank the board for the hard work and seeing through the formation of the Policy Advisory Committee. We very much appreciate the hard work there from the board and staff. As the board knows, the GSA and its committees are formed to represent broad interests of the basin, and having a functional and efficient governance structure is critical to successfully implementing SIGMA and identifying the, to the technical solutions that are going to be needed to meet the short and long-term water needs of the basin. And we heard some of those te uh, technical presentations uh, given this morning. Um, it's also important that we have uh, a collaborative process to maximize the funding opportunities for the basin as well. And uh, we heard today a lot of open questions um, on funding, and we heard about a desire for transparency. We've also heard, and I commend your thoughts, Supervisor Gleason, about integrating and utilizing the Policy Advisory Committee for some of these questions. We heard a need to engage disadvantaged communities, not only for engagement sake, but for funding eligibility. And we heard it stated that DWR would like to see a coordinated effort in grant fund planning. And so for those reasons, I'd like to offer a few time-sensitive recommendations for the board to consider in, a, in, a, in an effort to try to be helpful in uh, addressing the funding questions. There's two categories. One is structural, and the other is some specific funding thoughts. On structural, uh, the GSA should continue to provide uh, vision and structure to make sure that it is uh, in compliance with all requirements necessary to pursue and receive grant funding. So one of the issues there is making sure we're compliant with CASGEM, as that too is a prerequisite to getting grant funding. The second regards the, te the Technical Advisory Committee. I know we haven't addressed it yet today, but we'd encourage the board to see that the Technical Advisory Committee is formed as quickly as possible. And as I've said before from this, uh, from this uh, podium, the question of how you fund something depends largely on what it is that you're funding. And so the TAC could be used, and we ask that you consider using the TAC to work on developing and managing the technical information necessary and the resources needed to identify the best available project opportunities. And from there, you then can have a more focused discussion on what the funding is that will be required for those projects. Um, uh, using the TAC for that process would be fantastic and I think very effective. Second, and I'll be as quick as I can, we recommend that the board um, assign the Policy Advisory Committee um, or, or uh, with the responsibility of developing a, a funding strategy um, and to complement the work of the TAC. And this would include establishing what I'll call a funding working group comprised of a selection of PAC members uh, to develop funding proposals, strategies, and action plans to make sure we maximize the funding opportunities for the basin and for the region. Um, the funding working group would have, I would propose, something like an 18-month assignment and duration to cover the rapidly approaching grant funding issues, but also to present um, options for longer-term grant funding opportunities. And perhaps the board dissolves that committee when it achieves its function. And so that's the first category on structural. And the key there is the funding work group comprised of a selection of policy advisory committee members. Perhaps it works uh, under the direction of the finance committee that's been proposed. The second is just some specifics on funding recommendations. As the board knows, pursuing grant funding is going to be a very competitive process uh, throughout the state. Um, and it's going to require a very focused and collaborative effort. Uh, we're going to need to track opportunities. We're going to need to make sure that we are positioned uh, to, to, to pursue the rapidly approaching funding solicitation cycles and to make sure that we're in alignment with some of the regional planning processes. For example, the Inyo Mano Integrated Regional Management, uh, Water Management Planning Process. And so right now, what, I've, what I see personally are two potential opportunities, and I'm wrapping up. The first is Proposition 1, Sustainable Groundwater Management Program Funding, for up to between $1 and $1.5 million. That's a significant amount of money that's coming available. Um, I believe the process starts in the matter of months, so it's coming up very quickly. Uh, that might include $150,000 budget allocation uh, for some of the initial GSA operational costs. There's a real opportunity there. The second is the Prop 1 Integrated Regional Water Management Plan funding as well, which I think has been mentioned a little bit today. That'll come up in the first quarter of 2018. So that, too, is coming up very quickly. 
So again, that's going to require a collaborative effort, not only here in the basin, but also on a regional basis. So in short, Meadowbrook looks forward to participating in helping de derive a strategy for funding to help uh, to the GSA and the, and the basin succeed in the process. And I would just ask that you consider my comments today and some of my proposals for, for your thoughts on establishing that committee and utilizing the committee that we already have. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank We're going to need you. Thank you. Uh, Joshua Nugent on behalf of Mojave Pistachios and Nugent Ranches and I just wanted to say thank you guys for not only appointing us to the um, PAC like you had said you would but, but now more importantly filling it out with everybody else so we can get started. I'd also echo the encouragement to get the TAC up and running as well. And I agree with Derek that I think it's a good idea to get the PAC and the TAC somehow uh, linked up with the, the finance committee to get um, going on um, financing. So, uh, And I just also would want to um, one of the things to throw out there for you guys to think about, if there's any mechanism for like a large ag pumper to make an upfront contribution with still there being nebulous what they're going to eventually be charged, but having that somehow be like a credit towards whatever they would eventually be charged underneath the funding regime. And then also maybe at some point we could have another one of our fun nights and Ridgecrest meetings where we could get the public together to have a discussion about it as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nugent. Stan or Toro, uh, I support the development of a finance committee. Uh, however, I do not support an ad hoc committee. Um, the, we've had enough ad hoc committees. We need to settle down and do things in front of the public. I uh, have a standing committee. Do it right. There's plenty of work for a finance committee to do. Um, I do not believe that developing funding sources or evaluating should be the job of the Finance Committee. It should be the, the job of the PAC. I think that's what they were formed for, and I think that's what they need to do. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, I believe it was under the POA and M discussion, I suggested that we get the PAC and the TAC up and running as soon as possible. And I was disappointed that t today we haven't talked about a first meeting for either the PAC or the TAC. Time is running out. The 2020 is going to be here sooner than we think it is, and we need to start making some progress. Uh, so there's two things on the agenda uh, today, one of them is the water resources manager that's closed session. My feeling is, again, like I said the last time, the TAC needs to take a leading role in identifying the, R the RFP and the statement of work and then evaluating who we pick. And the longer we wait to get the TAC up and running, the longer it's going to be before we can get our experts on board helping make intelligent decisions. And of course the other thing is this uh, funding issue. We need the PAC up and running. Now they both probably need to jump in on both issues, but we need, certainly we need the PAC who is supposed to be representing the people and policy to be deeply involved in the funding options. Thank you. Thank you. This board, Mike Neal. Um, I'll give it a second until we get their attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I wanted to start off the few of the things I've heard that I support. Uh, one, one of which is that the funding for this uh, agency should, I believe, rightly, like Mr. Decker said, come from assessment on uh, the pumping of the water. Uh, whoever pumps the water most gets some. You know, they they're getting most of the work out of the the group. They ought to be paying the most, so I support that. And uh, Mr. Brown's suggestion having a finance committee is good. Mr. Rotora's comment that it needs to be full and open to the public standing committee, uh, that's, that's as it should be. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, one of the things that, that I've heard at the front end of this discussion from Mr. Christensen was very vague numbers thrown out to the air. Uh, and we all know that uh, you know what's going to happen is that people people in this space are going to get taxed to play, pay for the efforts of this agency, 
And uh, I don't think people, very many people are going to be very happy to see us hiring consultants to tell us how to go about getting money from us when they don't have any real direction as to how much money it is that they think they need to, uh, you know, suggest that we get. So I would hope that staff would sit down and, you know, take the necessary time and come up with some hard numbers. I don't envision that being that difficult, uh, at least for, you know, the next six to nine months of need. Uh, it's probably pretty easy to, uh, you know, approximate the, the uh, water resource manager's salary. Uh, the other costs, uh, you know, are maybe slightly more nebulous, but I think you can certainly tie it down within plus or minus 25 percent. Uh, you know, you guys should have plenty of experience with doing this kind of thing uh, and uh, get some hard numbers and then possibly some consultant to tell you, you know, okay, you can go get money from the people these various ways. Uh, you know, grant stuff is, you know, something else that we've said, you know, finance committee and even the, t the PAC can, can explore, and they need, they need to do that. But as far as taxing you know, us uh, to pay for this agency, we, uh, I want to see hard numbers. I'll just leave it that simple. Sophia Merck. Uh, I agree. I think we need to get the PAC started right away. And I would really like to see the finances looked at in the public, not as an ad hoc, ad hoc committee, but as, as open to the public as possible. We're talking about public money, we're talking about stakeholder money, and it needs to be within the public's purview. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on item seven? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and bring it to the board for comment and consideration. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Chair. It, just to remind everybody who's maybe forgot what happened, I don't know if I've slept a little bit, was it four or five months ago, we brought this issue up, we discussed financing then, we discussed the PAC, and we were immediately threatened with litigation. So this board needs to have some discussion about what the legal parameters are for putting any sort of pump tax or assessment uh, that are outside of what you would say is the general purview so that when we come to the public, we have an idea of where we are, what the legal frameworks are, wh where the exposures are, that you're not going to want to have in an open session. I don't think anybody wants me writing the opposition brief that sues this agency. That's one of the reasons why we would like to go to, at least at first, an ad hoc committee. It was what we had suggested back then, and during the process of getting to appointing an ad hoc committee, we were threatened with litigation. So, so there's, there's one thing to consider. The next, I've heard a, a couple commenters saying that we need to only worry about six months and pay for six months and then get passed. That's not the way 218 is going to work. We're going to need to have some hard numbers. Yes, we have to have hard numbers when we do that. But those hard numbers are going to need to be looking for year, two years out at a minimum, not just a small number. So uh, it is a process. You can't just put on the tax roll a six-month assessment. We're going to need to be thinking further out. And that's assuming it goes on the tax roll. Now, uh, somebody has mentioned the word assessment, and I've, I've used it again here too. This is probably not going to be a Section 4 218 assessment. This is most likely going to be sort of a rate charge under Section 6. Those are different animals, but some people call uh, Section 6 assessments if they're on your tax roll. That might be an option that this board uses as the tax roll to collect it rather than collecting it from the water district or sending out some other sort of billing structure for, for the, frankly, I think it's going to be the only way to collect it, frankly, uh, without having to find out who all is pumping private wells, sending out bills, hoping you collect them, having a billing service, additional costs. It's much easier to do it through the tax roll. So those are issues we have to consider also. And, and that's why you can't just have this short gap and, and, and change the numbers as you go over the next six months. And the next thing, yes, time is short. We are down to... 24 months, close to it, before we have to have something done. So being able to meet with an ad hoc committee, express the legal concerns, 
get those out of the way so that we can bring out some good, solid numbers to the public, that's what's needed right now. Thank you. My concern is, uh, I, I, I appreciate what you said. I understand that. I, I also believe we need to get the water resource manager on board quickly. And I'm not willing to hire a water resource manager until I have funds allocated that are real, that are there, that we can begin having and paying them. So the urgency of getting resolved to these issues is critical. I heard Mr. Hoffman, I liked his idea. I think it was kind of like a merger with my idea, which was uh, to get the uh, PAC uh, moving on um, understanding the financing and leveraging that, combining a PAC with a finance committee of some sort framework so that we can have some um, some uh, board involvement on this particular issue, understanding and highlighting the, uh, the urgencies and the priorities, and uh, leveraging the, the resources of the PAC to accommodate a recommendation to come back to this board, and whether it's in, in total or in stages as we move along, as it moves in parallel to what we're doing, so we finally get all these finances and priorities under, clearly understood. So um, uh, the, the public hearing is closed. And now we're addressed with item number seven, which is a, a discussion of revenue issues and concerns. Is there a motion that we'd like to consider informing a committee and um, joining them with the PAC or something like that? How do we want to go forward? Well, I'd, I'd just like to ask a question before you, uh, we continue with the motion. Uh, is your suggestion, and maybe Mr. Hoffman's suggestion, is that there be a couple of committee members from this group and maybe some, some members of the PAC that form together to help make a finance committee? Is that the, I mean, that wasn't where we were at a few minutes ago, I don't think. But I'm, uh, I'm you, you just said that you thought he, uh, his, his suggestion was in parallel with yours. So uh, I'm, I'm actually in favor of something like that because I think it adds some transparency to it and also might, um, uh, it, it could work pretty quickly, possibly. Any legal issues with what we're talking about? Uh, well, I I was suggesting we do an ad hoc committee, and I'm still going to suggest that because the committee needs to get legal input and it needs to be this board. But that committee, being an ad hoc committee, it's going to be board members. They can then meet with the PAC, and, and it has the flexibility in the future of turning and, and acting as a standing committee at some issues and at some times. So, so I'm giving you the flexibility. That's what I'm trying to build right. in here. Um, and I don't know, you know, you might have a PAC and a board combination meeting on, on something of this magnitude. I'm, I'm not certain right now, but, but i got to get to past that first rung on the ladder, which is to discuss some of these legal issues that need to be done. And to do that, I need it as an ad hoc committee. And that doesn't, that doesn't limit you from then having these other meetings and, and, and morphing it in in the future. So we don't even have to really assign um, the task, the finance committee, to go with the PAC. I mean, they will naturally do that as a committee to uh, leverage the existing resources and make that connection themselves. All we have to do is appoint, appoint an ad hoc finance committee with the expectation that they'll work closely with the PAC to come up with some recommendations for this board. Yes, we can, we can administratively notice any meetings like that that we would need in the future with the PAC. Thoughts? Immediately, I looked at you. Yeah, I know you did. Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand what um, Mr. Hall is, is proposing and, and suggesting and why he is. Um, and I do also like the idea of identifying, a, uh, after we get by that initial step that Mr. Hall is recommending, of figuring out how to get this board to be working directly with the PAC. I, I like that as well. So I'd, I, I guess what I would be asking for then is some assistance from Mr. Hall as to how to actually word or reword the motion that um, that board member Brown made that I seconded, so that we could make sure that we're clear on what our task is, that we're ad hoc only in it, you know in what form are we ad hoc, and that the board's intent is that we eventually move towards a standing committee that works with the PAC. <laughs> how, how to frame this. I, I think right now you just form a, a brief ad hoc committee to take care of finances. We know where it's going to go in the future. I mean, I, I can tell you just as a matter of law, 
you're going to have to have solid numbers. You're going to have to put those out to get you through a 218 process, whichever that is. All of that's going to have to happen. So public comment will eventually come. We just have to get to the first rung, maybe the second rung of the ladder before we can get up to the sixth rung. So if we just limited it to an ad hoc committee today to look at initial um, revenue concerns with the idea that we would come back next month and maybe report more and, and you know, with a short time frame, I think we're going to have to have this part of the ad hoc wrapped up in the next two to three months at most. With the expectation that the ad hoc committee would be bringing a recommendation along the potentially along the lines of, of what Alan mentioned of, of bringing a consultant on that would help us identify all of the um, requirements of 218 and how they might apply to whatever we, we might, you know, the different options we might be looking at? Uh, I think that's a very good possibility. Okay. So, um, Board Member Brown, are you, do you want to amend your motion slightly? Well, I could just use, I guess I could just say the word ad hoc because that's what um, everybody seems to want. Um, I totally want to form a, a standing finance committee. Um, I don't have a problem having a couple meetings just to assemble the data of all the possibilities, and I understand that. Um, I, I think it's kind of clear what, what, I mean, at least what I've already seen in the last 24 months of how you can fund these, these projects. So um, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I, I definitely want to um, move it forward to a, a, a standing committee and working with the PAC or whoever, and however it works out is fine. I think we just let it evolve, but for now, I can modify my motion to say um, uh, we can form a, a, an ad hoc, which is temporary, uh, finance committee. And I, I will second that amended motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have an ad hoc committee. Uh, let's retreat uh, six. Charlie, we've got six, back to six. Uh, we did, we reviewed applications, we made the appointments to the PAC, we adopt the resolution setting the PAC roster. We have a discussion of coordinator for policy advisory committee. Ms. Christensen. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Longbottom. I saw you fidgeting and I didn't, didn't pick up on your cues, <laughs> so my apologies. Um, this uh, item C is, I think, uh, uh, staff was asked to put this on, I think this is uh, Mr. Brown. Um, this is your time. Yeah, um, I knew this would take a while. Um, um, well, we all did. Um, and so, uh, like I said earlier, uh, w you know, at the Water District, we try to discuss things. We try to be preemptive as much as possible. I don't know what the deal is with these microphones. You guys need to invest some money. Um, anyways, um, how about we all pay for our own um, um, and get a longer one for the, the, uh, the uh, bully pulpit over there. Um, the Water District, uh, we're willing to fund a coordinator, and, and, and um, this what we thought this would help with is getting things started quickly. So we, we've already formed this pack. Um, Mick has some um, uh, action items already he's uh, written up that are very logical. And so uh, we want to just make the offer to this group that um, we, we all know we're going to have to spend money. And, and we have money set aside uh, for future sources of supply, so we would uh, use that fund, and, and um, we would like to um, offer uh, uh, funding a coordinator to uh, work with the um, PAC and the TAC if, if needed um, um, until you get this uh, manager on board, because um, it, it might take a few months or, or not uh, to do that. So we thought we could just plug somebody in right away and get started, start having meetings. Uh, start working on how the relationships work, what kind of subcommittees, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's the offer. Since we don't have a chair, can I jump in with a question? You, you, have, a vice, you have a vice chair, though. Oh, yeah. P Peggy's the vice chair, right? You're, you're in charge. Well, wake up. <laughs> Sorry. Dominic was sitting there. I didn't know he was there. Sorry. He's like the wind. <laughs> It just comes and goes. Um, so, are you are you intending? Is your thought that it would be a contribution to the aid to the authority and or uh, funding on your own a person or w in what form? Or you haven't thought that far into it? Well, yeah, I've thought into it um, quite a bit. Um, 
uh, yeah, we would just provide a person and pay for them uh, uh, to to start facilitating these meetings. So it, it's no cost to this this group. Um, um, for the, for the future funding, um, um, Joshua has a a, a good idea of, of what probably will happen. Is that us major water users will have to come up with some kind of funding. Um, maybe as a bridge, and that could be used for future, like a credit or something like that. So I, I see that as totally realistic and most probable uh, and least problematic. So um, so the offer is that we'll provide a coordinator, we'll pay for them, um, and it's just to get the ball off the um, um, going and, and get these committees started. Would, would you uh, be going out like with an RP or how, how, what's the mechanism for? No, we're just going to plug somebody in, whether it's our general manager or, okay. or Tim or or uh, or um, Dale. Sorry, Dale. I just forgot your name for a minute. Uh, anyways, yeah, we're just going to put somebody in there. It's, it's, we're just going to provide a service to get things going because because yeah. we all I, know that. I get what the the offer is. I just wasn't sure where, what the mechanism for getting that person was. So you, you, you'll just find somebody and uh, assign. Them. Say yes. No. Okay. What was this? What was? What was I'm sorry. So, uh, to to um, uh, summarize, um, I just. The water district uh, is making the offer to provide a coordinator to get these um, these committees off the ground, uh, the PAC and the TAC, if it when, once it's formed. And this was uh, 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 thought of as a bridge, so we could just get started. You wouldn't have to worry about RFPs, RFQs, um, hiring somebody. We'll just provide a person to help uh, coordinate things. We can start these meetings. Uh, we can start with your punch list over here and just get started. That's what we want to do. At no cost of this agency. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair um, when you were out, um, uh, Board Member Brown also had had suggested some potential people that they could plug in. I, I, I guess what I would request, because um, Board Member Kingsley asked this question, was how they would pick that person. It, it would be my preference that, uh, while I appreciate the offer, that if the Water District was to pick somebody, that they not pick somebody who is currently an applicant for one of the positions we want to hire. Uh, to act as this coordinator. I, I don't want to create a situation um, uh, in the future by by asking somebody to coordinate the PAC and the TAC that we're still considering whether or not to hire as the water resource manager. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. What happens when we hire a water resource manager? What happens? Does this position dissolve? Yeah. Um, I, I would say there would probably be a, a short overlap depending on who you hire. There's going to be a, a getting to know the, the terrain. So, yeah, I, I see this is just a temporary, like I say, it's a bridge to get things started right now. We can start right now. And, you know, I don't know if Dale's available or if Don wants to do it, but if that's where you want to go. <laughs> or we can put somebody and, else in and, there. And this is to coordinate the pack? Yeah, it's, it's just to get things going. It's to put somebody in there that can, they can uh, j just coordinate the beginning of these meetings and, and start... Uh, start your projects, uh, the ones that don't require a ground uh, water coordinator. Uh, it's just a concept. If you have a better idea, I'm all ears. I just wanted to, I just want to get things started. And, it's, um, um, and everybody knows that time is limited. Mr. Kingsley and then Mr. Page. Uh, that seems like a generous offer, and it does seem like it would be helpful to have somebody who coordinated the first meetings, you know, get the word out, and that's going to take a little bit of effort. And I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of, of you appointing uh, Dale to that position. <laughs> I'm sure she'll do it if she gets paid. Um, good. Sometimes words are important, and I know we've been talking about coordinator, and I, and I understand what you mean by coordinator. But if this board's going to give any kind of direction and accept an offer, um, I, I, I would suggest that we, we change it to facilitator. Because for, for me, a facilitator is somebody who does not impart their own point of view. Um, they only are facilitating the discussion. They're not direct, you know, they're not steering it a specific way or providing their opinion. Uh, whereas a coordinator, somebody could perceive that they're somehow running the, the pack or the attack, and I, I want to try to avoid that. So in terms of using a term that, that 
conveys more what this we, we would be intended by this this person, I'd prefer to use facilitator. That way, it, it makes it clear that we're not asking that person to um, take control of those those bodies. I have this question. Um, just my experience uh, tells me that because we're a newer agency and you know we're we're trying to. I understand this is a struggle. We we deal with this all the time, trying to have people enough time and resources to do what we need to do. My experience tells me that if that you need to identify, and I think your board should have some understanding of this, what the job description is, um, because you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. Because that's where problems occur when when you don't, and and a, a contractor would would do that anyway, but. I think you just want to be clear, adding what Bob said, words are important so, so you don't get off track or expectations are not met. Thanks. I have a different take on this deal. Um, but although I like your premise, we, the, 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 idea, the genesis of the idea is to get the pack moving. I think um, we let the pack get the pack moving. And I think uh, the PAC takes ownership of their leadership. I think they, uh, as a matter of fact, on my list of paper thing, I was going to say, hey, PAC, uh, pick a leader, uh, get, get things moving. And I think we should allow the PAC the opportunity to demonstrate that it can, it is motivated, it is ready to go, and it uh, can achieve what it wants to achieve without us having to babysit it at the present time. If we need to assert some facilitation or coordination, uh, we will find that out shortly and we will reconsider it. If there are some personality issues, if there's some teaming issues that uh, are not are hindering the pack from being an effective body, uh, then we got to bring in the guns to help it uh, achieve what it needs to achieve. But I think we let them, give them an opportunity to uh, develop their own personality and to develop their own way of doing things. That's what I think. But, but, but you know, I, say, I will also say that's time limited because they have to move and I will give them a month. Is that, is, what do you guys think about that? Anybody? Any I thoughts say, on that? I say go for it. To, um, uh, broadcast your list and, and get the thing started and see how it works. When we talked about what the, uh, what the, what we thought the ta the pack should be, one of those things was develop, find a leader, find a chair, and get started and get going and come back to us. I like the idea of a time frame, though, because I don't want to have them spend the two years we've spent trying to get this up. You haven't got two years. We, none of us have two years. And, and if we give them a month, um, I would like to give them a month and a half or before our next meeting, a report at the next meeting, what they've done, how they've accomplished it. But they do need somebody to call a meeting together. And if, if Dale is, or somebody, somebody has to say, we're going to meet on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. We don't have anybody to do that. So there has to be some sort of outside help from, from staff or here to make that pack get involved. Have we have we gone to the public yet for their comment? Not on this topic. No. On this topic, we have not. Well, can can we do that? Let's let's do that because I'll bet there are members of PAC out there who have opinions on how we do this. So let's open the public hearing. Let's sit with have hear what you have to say about uh, this item. Yes, uh, Mike Neal. Uh, not surprisingly, we were having a joint conversation. I think you probably noticed in the back there while you were basically saying, let's just cut the pack loose and let them do their job. And we, th we totally applaud that. Uh, we think the pack just needs to have a chairman and give them their task list and, and you know, let them cut loose. If you need any coordination, all we're seeing is that maybe, you know, Mr. Christensen helps them to set a time for the first meeting. Uh, I don't know, remember the bylaws and what it talked about meeting schedule for the PAC, but I uh, assume they can set their own schedule, you know, if they want to meet every single week and, uh, you know, try to get it done. Uh, I would just say, you know, I have probably pretty good confidence that, that they're going to uh, do better than you guys have, like Peggy said, and not take two years to get there. So, you know, a month seems a little short maybe for getting, you know, some significant action done, but... Uh, not much more than that, I wouldn't think, and you'd see at least several items come out of that committee with suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, West Kassenstein, uh, pleased, I believe, to be on the PAC. <laughs> uh, 
Just an observation. I, I was in a circumstance once where I was helping carry a major proposal to some technical forum in Geneva representing the Navy, and uh, I foolishly accepted chairmanship of that committee that was to consider my own proposal, and I was completely neutered in any ability to support the proposal I was bringing forward. So if, if we end up creating a chairman uh, from within the PAC, that chairman's going to have a problem because he is going to have a consist consistency to support. Uh, and so in, from that point of view, uh, I would suggest it might make sense to have a facilitator or someone who does not have a consistency to, re and I can say that word after a beer, but uh, <laughs> so my suggestion is that uh, there may be some value in having some person who does not represent someone uh, to uh, So is that the first people. impact from the pack? <laughs> is that what we're hearing? A good idea, the first one? Way to go, Wes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Oh, oh, we got another PAC comment coming up. Uh, also proud to be Please a say member of the PAC, Nick Panzer. Thank you. Yeah, I like the idea of getting that first PAC meeting called by someone not on the PAC and very quick. Like today, <laughs> this week, I'm ready to rock and roll. I know West okay. is. Uh, I'm anxious to get going, and I assume every member on that PAC is ready to start firing on eight cylinders. We need someone to call that first meeting, and I think you'll find out how quickly we can take that job on. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I just got a note from my uh, chief of staff that says, I volunteer to coordinate the first meeting of the PAC. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> I think we say yes. <laughs> Do I have to pay you extra? Does this increase your salary? She said she code. volunteered. Underlying volunteer. Okay. Um, all right. I, I, I like the idea. I want to get it going. Uh, that's fine by me if that's fine by the board. Fine. Um, yeah. But I think that uh, what I've heard PAC members say, and I, I, we, and I heard the, the genesis of this whole conversation is get momentum. Going. Yeah, momentum. We got to build it. We got to build it quick. We got a lot of tasks that we have here. We're going to assign them. So, go ahead. Uh, two quick things to remind everybody of the the board here will set the PAC scheduled meetings that was one thing that we was discussed multiple times and part of the reason for that was the PAC meeting is going to create costs for the authority so the PAC meeting schedule was going to be controlled by the board and at the first meeting um, we had it set up originally in the bylaws for this board to pick the board chair of the PAC but People in the public wanted the PAC to pick its chairperson and vice chair, and um, that is now in the bylaws. So at the first meeting, the first order of business of the PAC is going to be to pick their board per, uh, chairperson and vice chair. Okay. But, we, but this board needs to set that meeting so that they can do that. Okay. So uh, first of all, we have to um, assign the coordinator of the PAC, which is the our item that we have to vote on. So we have a motion, but we have a volunteer. Do we need a motion? I mean, we're just going to need a motion on that or facilitate her help? Uh, I, I, you could motion if you'd like, or we could just do it administratively, since uh, we're do already just doing do general manager stuff. Let's do it. Um, do we want to have a conversation? It's not agendized, but do we want to have a conversation about um, assigning them a ta the task of the chair, electing a chair, they can do that themselves also, right? That's their first job and order of business under the bylaws. It's also on my first list here. That so. Me. Okay. So are we done with item C? Do we need a vote? We don't need a vote on item C, 6C. Oh, Mr. oh I'm sorry. I just okay. was hoping I'd get some clarification from Mr. Hall regarding the, the meeting schedule and the board's responsibility for setting that. Is, it, is that setting the schedule or is that setting every meeting? Could, could this first meeting be considered a special meeting that, that just a dates gets picked, but when they meet and, and have some discussion about setting a regular schedule, what works for them, they make a recommendation to us and then we can vote to actually adopt a meeting schedule. So, so there, there is actually a provision in the bylaws, I believe it is, uh, which one is it here? Small phone, I need to get an iPad. Um, I believe it's 5.2. You're going to need to set the schedule, and, and we talked about this repeatedly because, you know, every time they meet creates costs for the authority. 
So you'll, you'll need to set a schedule. There is a process in here so that if they need a special meeting, that they can go through and, and seek to get that special meeting set and approved by the board without having to come back to a full board meeting. So uh, you're going to need to set a schedule. I don't, I don't know if you want to do that now because you need to have that first meeting so they can tell you what their schedule kind of looks like and, and then really work in coordination with them. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm comfortable, Mr. Chair, with letting them hold a special meeting as a first meeting and come to us with a recommendation for a schedule that we can uh, adopt. And, and I'm fine with saying that I don't care what date the, the special meeting is, um, that okay. if they want to run that through you as the chair to get the board's okay to have a special meeting, I'm okay with that as well. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we've done with 6C. 6 Delta, applications for technical advisory committee. Thank you. Uh, so I think someone from the public mentioned about the, uh, the TAC, the technical advisory committee. We just wanted to let people know publicly that um, uh, we don't have an application. We would, uh, because there's technical uh, sort of requirements to be on the TAC, we, uh, we would just ask that you submit a resume with all your technical qualifications. Uh, you can submit that to my email address, or you can send it to the uh, clerk of the board, which is at the uh, Indian Wells Valley Water District. Um, again, it's just you can put a cover letter if, if you like or not, uh, but uh, just let us know it's a, a TAC application, and we will uh, we will consider those. Um, so uh, this is sort of just the official letting, shout out that uh, please submit. Thanks, sir. Let's open to the public for your thoughts. On applications for the Technical Advisory Committee. We're going to put a time frame on that. A real quick initial question. You didn't specify who could submit, Alan. So is this oh. the, the PAC member? Needs Thank you. Thank you, yes. Well, go ahead. It, it, that, that is also <laughs> in the bylaws. Uh, essentially, if you are a PAC member, you get the opportunity to uh, put a name in for somebody on the TAC. Not sure that everybody who's on the PAC will do that. They have the wherewithal to, but but that's sort of the structure. So how many members will be on the TAC is a little unknown at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Commander. And Ms. Breeden, you had a... A question is a time before. frame. I want to put a time frame on there so they know within 15 days or 30 days that they're all in and done. Thanks. Let's hear public, and then are you done? Derek Hoffman, Legal Counsel from Meadowbrook. I was going to just make the same comment that might find more success setting a time frame for those applications. Thanks, sir. For nominations. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Here comes the pack. Uh, Wes Kassenstein again, and I... I guess there should also be a deadline for PAC members to make nominations for possible TAC members. Thanks, sir. Okay, public hearing is closed. Bring it back to the board for comments. Mr. Christensen, you want to start us off? I know we have uh, some issues with times, timelines. Time, uh, I'm sorry. Deadlines for applications. Oh, yes. Um, uh, if you decide uh, you want to have this done by the next meeting, we would need to, uh, um, if that's your desire, we'd need to have that information to us by, pardon me, July, hold on, July 10th? We could probably, uh, our meeting is on the 20th, right? Is that correct? Yeah, the 10th would give us five days. Yeah. So. To, to the agenda. Yeah, the, by the end of day on the 10th, end of the day, 5 p.m. on the 10th. We can go longer than that if you desire. We'd probably go into another meeting. It, I just remind the board, you know, th this process is going to be much different. We're, we're really nominating anybody who's on the pack so long as the person that they've submitted is of, uh, has the ultimate qualifications of being an expert in this field. So, any other thoughts? I'm running out of thoughts. Okay. <laughs> so, um, we have a.
completed discussion on applicants for technical advisory committee. The yes. deadline is when? Uh, 5 p.m. on July 10th. How are we going to get that out to people who aren't here today? Uh, we can do an ad just like we did last time and get... I guess you're right. No, it would have to be a contact. We, we, if they're not here today... We'll just contact each PAC member because yeah, they're the ones that get to nominate. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we got a plan, we got a deadline, uh, we got satisfaction. Okay, let's move on to item. Any other conversations about six delta or anything on six? No. Did yes, I hear that we, we need to establish the meeting of the PAC here still? Or no? Yeah, you should. No. No, okay. We'll we'll pick a date administratively. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, it brings us to item eight, my favorite. Report on plan of action milestones for groundwater sustainability plan. Um, I don't know how long you want to spend on this item, but staff did a really, really good job on a beautiful piece of product product that you have in your uh, binders. It is uh, in a much different format. I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Mr. Longbottom to, to give you some insight as to how that happened. Thank you. Mr. Long, Commander Longbottom. All right. Um, so I, I take no credit for this. This was the work of staff, um, but they did a fantastic job. So what we're trying to do on this, um, we're going to get in a little bit um, more, I guess, printer-friendly format at some point here. But what we're trying to do is incorporate what the specific tasks are um, within the framework of an established program. And... Also on the right-hand side, you see the various uh, duration of the tasks and their dependence upon each other. And so you'll see the small arrows, similar if anyone's ever used Microsoft Project. It talks about the task and what, what needs to happen in what order. Um, some things can happen at the same time, whereas other things need to happen before, the, before a, another event can begin. So the, the purpose here is to list out everything that we need to do to get to the GSP, how it's dependent upon each other, what the durations of it are. And then we added in a comment section so that we can also talk to who has the action and what the status of that action is as we move forward. Thank you, Commander. Okay, let's open the public for comment. Mr. Chair, before anybody comes up, if, if you'd like, we can put this out on the web uh, for anybody to see. Yes. Uh, and we'll do that. Um, I just warn folks that they're going to have to get an 11 and a half by 17 printer because it's just going to take some doing. But you can, you can, you know, enlarge it if you want to on your screen. So the public has not seen this, is that correct? Uh, no, they have. No, well, it, it's in the, actually it was in the packet that we mailed out. Uh, we actually sent a separate okay. file for it. Thank you. Anyone in the, in the public? I think this is, because, this is going to be one of the key items to our success. It's going to build a picture of where we are, where we want to go, and how we're going to get there, and what stages along the way. So having a real good understanding of this is going to be critical to our success. Uh, no one in the public wants to comment? I'll bring it back to the board for comment and consideration. I do, sir. Um, what is the action with this? Is somebody taking the action? Who is responsible, and how are we doing it? Go ahead. I, well, I think the important thing to recognize is that this, this is going to be the primary tool of the water resource manager. And so what we at, and staff are trying to do at this particular point is to give, a, give that water resource manager a starting point. So this is kind of the temporary plan to the best of our ability and knowledge using what we have at our hands today with the funds we have in our hands today and just keep the momentum going forward. Once we get the water resource manager on board, this will get tweaked drastically, I would imagine. And I would add to that that that, that person or firm or team would report on this to you on a regular basis using this tool or, or whatever form it it. it uh, molds into, but that would be the, the vision, is that they would be accountable to you on the progress of this. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we need a vote? No vote? Okay, let's move on to general uh, item number nine, general manager's report. I, I will be very short. Um, Thank you. We... Um, 
we are opening up a dialogue with the um, um, LADWP. Um, our CAO has used to work for LA County, and so we are in anticipation of hopefully of whatever kind of relationship we can um, have with them to facilitate any kinds of opportunities. We're starting to do that, so I just wanted to let you know that that we want it, that we see that as a as an advantageous relationship that could only produce um, some positive. Uh, and we'll be, I'll be working with the chair on that. Um, second, uh, we will be visiting, my, myself and the chair will be visiting Sacramento again uh, within the next uh, 30 days, would be my guess. We're still trying to get a date. We had a date, and then it had to get moved. Uh, again, to go meet with DWR, meet with uh, others, uh, the water board if necessary. Um, uh, it, again, my goal would also to meet with staff, uh, the grant the grant staff associated with uh, uh, DWR to, uh, that's always a good connection to make. So we'll be doing that. And then the third thing is that, uh, and Phil can probably expand on this, apparently our uh, JPA or this GSA and the JPA document we use to form this is, a, is being used throughout the state. Uh, when I say throughout the state, it's not being, I don't know if it's being used widely, but it is being used by others as a model. So um, that's good news that, that people see the value of what we've done here. And uh, at least in a couple other places, uh, it is being used and spreading from there. Thanks, Christian. Board members, any thoughts? Yes, sir. Mr. Page. I had a, Mr. Chairman, I had a quick question for council, if I may. I um, was curious whether the formation of this JPA um, under SB 1266, if it's required to be sent to the LAFCOs and H3, Counties, and if you think it is, has it been sent to the three LAFCOs in each county before the deadline? That, that is a uh, interesting and tricky question legally. I, I am not certain that this GSA is providing municipal services as is required by that section. I can tell you, Kern County LAFCO asked us for it, and we submitted it. If they had not asked me for it, I would not submit it, and I would say that most other GSAs in Kern County will not be submitting any JPAs. Um, but it, it's not a simple legal question. I, if you really had to nail me down, I think you're probably not providing municipal services like that. Is there a harm in just sending it to the three LAFCOs just to check that box off and not worry about the question about whether we meet the definition of municipal services? No harm at all if you want to send it in, which is why when they asked, we, we sent it. Um, knowing San Diego County LAFCO staff, they haven't specifically contacted me, but if they don't get it, would you mind sending it to San Diego County LAFCO? Sure, we'll do that. Thank you. Yes, do it, do them all. You bet. In your Other comments from board members? I've got a couple. First of all, I wanted to uh, echo a couple things that uh, Ms. Christensen said. Uh, we, we need to be proud of our GSA and the work we've gone through in establishing this JPA because it's not just here, but there are other places in the state of California. I certainly know there are other places in Kern County that are examining very closely what we're doing up here, know very much what's going on, and are modeling their programs after things uh, that we're doing and uh, understanding um, that we've created because, uh, through all the hard work we've done. So thank you all. We're all part of that. Thank you very much. Uh, LADWP, you talked about LADWP. I'm absolutely convinced that we cannot succeed in this uh, effort without the support of LADWP. We cannot approach this as uh, we can solve our own problems. We need to go out, and uh, building relationships is going to be key to our success. And so we're going to be working very hard to bring LADWP into an understanding of where we are, what we're doing, where we're going, uh, we have some contacts we're working, and uh, we're going to be reaching out. I'm hoping that other board members can help me uh, develop and foster that relationship with LADWP. One of the things we're doing with the LADWP right now is uh, their worries regarding uh, flooding in Mono County and Inyo County up north, and uh, their releases of water on the LA aqueduct coming south. Uh, so what we're doing in coordination with uh, BLM, thank you very much, 
and with an understanding with LADWP is we are, and thanks to Mrs. Quist, uh, we are beginning tomorrow. Uh, you're going to see some bulldozers and some stuff going on on Fremont Gulch where we're going to um, develop a, a way to slow the water down that they're releasing out of uh, the aqueduct. And we're going to be putting some riprap and some boulders into the gulch itself. We've gone through all the uh, permitting processes and all the, um, the environmental uh, requirements in order to do that. So you're going to see some, um, some heavy equipment up there. And uh, the purpose of that is to, when the releases happen from the LA aqueduct, we're going to slow the water down. So it just doesn't rush straight off to the, uh, the uh, ply out there on the base. It's going to give it more time to absorb into our aquifer. Uh, July 31st is, um, is, is, I heard someone say, I think it was Mr. Hoffman, that uh, we need a deadline for uh, grant applications for, for this Prop 1 funding. And so that brings me to um, some tasks I would like to assign uh, the PAC. Uh, one of the first ones I have here is coordinated through the, the mayor and myself uh, and, and uh, uh, Peter. Uh, we need to get leadership on board quickly. Uh, you guys figure it out. You guys just do it. I don't care how you're going to do it. You're going to set up a meeting up and get it going. We need uh, leadership when we need to uh, get that moving. We need an outreach study. We still have people in this, in this valley who don't understand Sigma and don't understand what we're faced with. I'd like to have uh, the PAC uh, research and develop an outreach study that we can um, move on quickly. Uh, we need to coordinate Prop 1 funding priorities with other agencies in the Indian Wells Valley. We have everybody uh, want to do great stuff, and there's a lot of great stuff to be done, but we can't do everything, and we have no money, so we need to prioritize how we're going to get to that Prop 1 funding, who's going to get there, what resources do you need from this board, uh, what resources do you need from this community, whatever your needs are, uh, develop those. Uh, those recommendations, uh, get them to us as quickly as you can, and we'll work together to, um, to move on your uh, recommendations when we can. Become an expert on Prop 1 funding. You need an expert. Uh, we, we need to, as we go through this process, I think another key ingredient to our success is our ability to keep our economy moving in a positive direction. And so in an effort to do that, um, we need to understand how we're going to continue moving our economy in the right direction and, and manage that within a constricting environment of water. So it's a, it's a broader economic perspective that uh, we would like the PAC to look at and develop a plan for how we're going to grow uh, and where we're going to grow, how we're going to define growth, what's that look like, how can we do that with uh, restricting water use. Or, or implementing uh, additional water use. How are we going to do it? Did I, did I get all of those? I think I, I, think, I think I did. I think I got all of them. Okay, so those are your initial taskers. Uh, and we need reports, uh, Madam Coordinator, uh, ASAP, quickly. And don't wait for a meeting. I mean, when you get stuff that's ready to go, shoot it out to us. Any other thoughts from anybody? Um, it, well, I'll just mention that uh, your outreach with the city of L.A., will be sensitive to Inyo County. Um, uh, as someone who works from, you know, on almost a daily basis with from their commissioners down to their water spreaders and, and uh, that, that Anne, who has a constituent base who uh, really looks at uh, our relationship with the city in a, in a fishbowl, uh, I, I will be interested in, and I think I can be helpful, but I also uh, just just understand that 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 relationship, or as you build a relationship, uh, could be sensitive to um, to my constituents and myself. Thanks. I'll keep you post. I'll keep you posted on all activities before they happen. Yeah, it's 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 a. Yeah, I mean, good, good point. Are we done, Dale? Okay, I think we're. Done. Uh, no other comments. Uh, this board meeting is over, and I need a motion to re to uh, go to closed session. So moved. Okay, we have a motion. We're over, and we're going to closed session. Thank you all. Appreciate